on modeling of climate and related tipping points. Um, so we have two very distinguished speakers in this session, but before I introduce them, um, please allow me just to give you a few perspectives on climate change from where I sit, because as Rodolfo was saying, this is not um, now an exclusively environmental issue. It is now the front and the center of the agenda of ministries of economy and finance. And as you've seen recently, it's being increasingly considered also by central banks. So here uh, at the economic department of the OECD, uh, we also, uh, we've also been playing increasing attention to climate change consideration for, for the past two years. We've been upgrading our modeling framework to better reflect the macroeconomic implications of climate policies. And we're also integrating fully climate policies in OECD country surveys, um, because as you know, policies to address climate change are, are in fact, uh, and have become an integral part of the structural reform agenda not only because they will have implication in terms of displaced labor and capital and firms and also impact on regions, but uh, also because policymakers face very difficult choices of where to allocate their resources, whether it's for climate mitigation, climate adaptation, or for other policy domains like education and health. So it's part of the same trade-off. And for that reason, um, for that reason, improving the modeling of climate risks, and that includes tipping points, um, obviously that can strengthen our argument for allocating more resources to climate mitigation policies or to adaptation. And within this context, understanding tipping points, their interaction, and how they can impact the economy uh, is obviously essential. So, if we just focus for a minute of, on, on tipping point themselves, as you know, um, it's now been two decades that the IPCC is providing increasing evidence that tipping points may be reached at lower levels of warming than we previously thought. Uh, and the increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events like what we have seen over the summer um, most recently, that's very alarming on, on the risks linked to climate change. And, and in economics, we've tended to focus on incremental climate change and economic costs. Uh, but now we see that, you know, large scale tipping points, uh, such as the disintegration of the Greenland or West Antarctic ice sheets or permafrost collapse, that would have uh, not only if irreversible changes on the climate system, but also dramatic economic and social consequences. And even more so that there may be interactions between tipping points, which can further amplify the economic and social consequences. Um, so what, what we really hope to uh, hear from our speaker is some insight on the economic consequences of such tipping points on how we should we could reflect them better um, for the near and medium term economic policy making advice we're trying to provide how to integrate them how to integrate the uncertainties surrounding them into short and long term economic projections um, and this is obviously uh, very difficult because uh, those are discrete, discrete germs and we need to include them uh, into economic models, which are by definition usually not discrete, but very continuous. So that we, we not only need to understand the level of temperature at which tipping points are triggered, the speed and magnitude at which they unfold, but also the special distribution of their impact and eventually their potential reversibility. Um, so that requires country, region specific uh, understanding, and, and it is very important for us to make the case to policymakers that they need to act particularly quickly. So let me um, introduce the two speakers of the first session. Um, as, you, as you heard from Odolfo, and you may have seen from the program, this session aims to provide 
really an overview of the physical science that underpins climate tipping point and also their possible consequences on the economic system. So for that, we will first listen to Professor Tim Lenton, who will introduce what we know about the physical science of climate tipping points in a very short manner, obviously, because it's much larger than the 15 minutes he has. And Professor Lennon is the founding director of the Global Systems Institute, and he's also the chair in climate change and earth system science at the University of Exeter. And we're super pleased to have him because he's developed and used models to understand the behavior of the Earth as a system for more than 20 years. Um, he has a lot of awards, um, especially for the work he's realized for identifying tipping points in the climate system, um, and also how he's examined how positive tipping points within our social system would help accelerate progress towards a sustainable future. So thanks, uh, Professor Lenton. And then we'll have Dr. Elizabeth Kopitz, who will give an overview of the economic modeling of tipping points and how to incorporate tipping points into policy analysis. And Dr. Kopitz is a senior economist at the National Center for Environmental Economics in the Office of Policy at the US Environmental Protection Agency. And we're very grateful you're taking some time to be with us. Um, Dr. Kopitz is responsible for providing economic analysis and expertise to support a very wide range of policy actions, such as air quality standards for ozone, regulations affecting the oil and natural gas sectors, mobile sources, landfills, compliance with the National Environmental Policy Act. She has served, Dr. Kopit has served since 2009 as the lead for the EPA's team of economists and climate scientists. Um, who support the technical development of the US government's social cost of greenhouse gas estimates. So I'm very pleased and thank you very much for being with us today. And with this, let me pass the floor to Professor Tim Little. Thank you very much, Charles. I'll just share my screen. Uh, hopefully you're seeing everything okay, folks. Brilliant. Okay, so I'm just here to give a brief uh, introduction on the state of scientific knowledge on climate tipping points. So I'm going to start with a, a little movie in which I'm forcing some complex system past a tipping point. It's here to illustrate that many complex systems have alternative stable states or attractors. They're often subject to sort of short term variability. You see the ball rolling around in the valley that's getting ever shallower. And thanks to the forcing that I imposed as the modeler, uh, I destabilized the, the state that the system started in until we reached a tipping point where it transitioned abruptly into another state. And what's happening there is what we call positive amplifying feedbacks are taking over from damping negative feedbacks at the tipping point and propelling change within this system. And you might have seen in the video that before we got to the tipping point, the ball rolled around a little bit more slowly in the valley as it got ever shallower. And that slowing recovery from perturbations is a generic early warning signal that a tipping point might be coming. And the red line at the bottom was just to show you a, a statistical indicator that we can pick up early warning signals of tipping points in many complex systems, for example, one point in time becomes more like the previous point in time. We call that increasing lag one autocorrelation, if you want to know the technical term, and that's what the red indicator shows. So we'll come back to that early warning indicator in a minute because we start to see it in real data. But uh, having got our eye in for what uh, the general concept of a tipping point, this was the an early version of a map I drew up with colleagues of what we call tipping elements in the climate system. So large scale parts of the Earth's climate system, order 1000 kilometers or more in spatial scale, where we had good evidence that they could exhibit alternative stable states and that under um, human caused global warming, there was a risk that we could tip the transition from one state to another. I've subdivided them here by things involving 
ice melting in simple terms in blue, things involving reorganizations of the circulation of the ocean and the atmosphere, or the two of them coupled together in red, and uh, abrupt loss of major biomes in green. And what I'm going to do in a minute is show you a little bit of an update of this uh, list or map. Before we get there, though, um, it's important to review that new sources of evidence are coming in all the time. And in the last decade in particular, we've seen several of new sources of evidence that raise our risk um, rating, if you like, of, for climate tipping points. So this is one source of evidence. This is just a slide summarizing that in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's own models, one can find many abrupt shifts as one warms the model worlds up into the future. And interestingly, uh, there's a cluster of abrupt shifts in the models that happens, starts happening at where we are now at just over one degrees of global warming above pre-industrial. And lots of abrupt shifts seem to be clustered at one and a half to two degrees C of warming in the models. And there would be a whole load more at high temperatures, by the way. There just aren't many model scenarios going up to such high temperatures. And you can just get a loose feel from the map of where some of these abrupt shifts are going on um, in the climate models. So that's one source of evidence that has caused uh, a collective um, how can I put it, raising of the red flag of climate tipping point risk higher up the flagpole, if you like. In simple terms, we thought 20 years ago that it would take four or five degrees of global warming above pre-industrial before um, we had a sort of even odds chance of passing some climate tipping points. Now, based on the recent IPCC special reports, um, we would all acknowledge, I think, as climate scientists, that we're in the danger zone already at a little over one degree of warming. And I'll say a bit more about it, but we've got uh, several sources of evidence that we're risking tipping points, um, even in the Paris Agreement range of one and a half to two degrees C of warming, let alone what happens at higher temperatures, where obviously the risk increases um, perhaps steeply further. So this is just a map summarizing some of the evidence or sources of evidence we have that accelerating change is happening in the wrong direction in some of these candidate tipping elements in the climate system that we identified over 10 years ago. And if I was to, if you were to ask me where did I think there was the most compelling evidence we might already be at a tipping point, it would be for part of the West Antarctic ice sheet where we see the re accelerating retreat of glaciers um, consistent with um, some physics of ice flow that we think could be irreversible retreat. And they drain the equivalent of about 1.3 meters of sea level rise in the ice equivalent. Now, luckily the ice is going slowly at the moment, but, but by the nature of these self-reinforcing feedbacks, it's the, the loss is accelerating. And we also see accelerating loss of ice from the Greenland ice sheet, and we would struggle to rule out that that might be past the tipping point for, for irreversible meltdown. And several other elements of the climate, as you can see, are also showing some evidence of, it, of change in the wrong direction that's speeding up, including the, slow, uh, the slowing of the Atlantic overturning circulation and uh, the loss of the Amazon rainforest, not just from people chopping it down, but from extraordinary drought events, for example. So what I'm doing now is showing a lot of complicated wiggly lines, but they refer back to the video we started with, where I tried to show that there are generic early warning signals before tipping points. And what I'm trying to show you here is that for Arctic sea ice, which we know is declining, and for the Greenland ice sheet, which we know is melting at an accelerating rating rate, and for the Atlantic's overturning circulation, which we know is getting weaker, we also see important information in the nature of the fluctuations of these systems. And basically, we see rising variance, rising temporal autocorrelation in the data, which are the two clear mathematical signals we expect um, on heading towards a tipping point. In other words, the early warning signals are there in these, these three important systems um, that not only are, are they 
changing in the wrong direction and at an accelerating rate, but they show clear early warning signals of approaching a tipping point. If we turn to the Amazon, uh, it's only in review at the moment, but now we're looking spatially at trends in this early warning indicator, temporal autocorrelation in data that is satellite derived data for fluctuations in the biomass content of the forest. And red is bad news. <laughs> so lots of the forest and on aggregate, the forest is showing this early warning signal, it's losing resilience in ecologist language. The feedbacks that normally stabilize the forest are getting weaker. That's also consistent with the approach to a tipping point. So um, that's, why, that's why we're concerned. And that's not the only reason why we're concerned as scientists, because we also know and begin to see that there are causal interactions between these tipping elements. So we know the Arctic is warming two or three times as fast as the global average, largely because of the loss of the sea ice, replacing a highly reflective white surface with a dark ocean surface that absorbs far more sunlight. And that accelerated Arctic warming is contributing to this accelerated melt of the Greenland ice sheet, let alone the thawing of the permafrost and the dieback of boreal forests. It's also leading to more precipitation in the Arctic region and the mixture of extra precipitation and extra meltwater from Greenland, this freshens up the surface waters of the Atlantic Ocean, right where deep waters usually form that propel the whole overturning circulation of the Atlantic. So causally, those rainfall and melt is, weak, is contributing to the weakening of this great overturning. And the records we have from Earth's recent past show us that as you weaken the Atlantic overturning, you shift a band of rainfall all the way around the tropics southwards, disrupting monsoons pretty much all around the planet. You leave extra heat in the Southern Ocean as well, which is a problem for the ice sheets there. So we see the problem that the causal interactions between the tipping elements are a bit like the proverbial dominoes on, uh, stood up on end. You tip one and it makes tipping another more likely. So just to show you a little bit of ongoing work, um, we're busy trying to update the assessment of what should be on the map of tipping elements, where we're going to subdivide um, the, the map, if you like, between what we call global core tipping elements, things that contribute to the overall operational functioning of the whole climate system and have major impacts on the global scale, including potentially strong, some strong feedbacks to warming in some cases. We're going to distinguish that from some regional impact tipping elements which whilst they might not, if they go, may not completely transform the global climate, which still have major impacts on human welfare. And then there's a whole lot of other stuff that's still super important for the climate change problem, but we would class as kind of uncertain or unlikely tipping elements or feedbacks, but feedbacks that are not strong enough to show a tipping point. So this is a work in progress, but we see a number of familiar things on the map of the global core tipping elements, but we add a few candidates like the collapse of what's called deep convection in the Labrador Sea, um, that has impacts that are not quite as large as collapsing, collapsing the Atlantic overturning circulation, but are still pretty profound. In simple terms, uh, if that is disrupted, we get something like a little ice age in Europe, and we get up to 30 centimeters of sea level rise along Boston, New York, and the Northeast seaboard of the US, to give you a flavor. And you notice down here that we've put major parts of the East Antarctic ice sheet on the map as, as now of global core tipping elements at risk with all associated sea level rise associated with them, like of the order five meters that could come from the East Antarctic subglacial basins. In terms of the regional impact tipping elements, that's where a lot of the biosphere components I think belong um, and the West African monsoon and Sahel system but also the major sort of non-polar glaciers. And then, yeah, there's a whole lot of stuff that's important, but may not, we may not have enough evidence yet to keep it firmly on the tipping elements map. So some things like the Arctic summer sea ice, it's a super important feedback. Current thinking is it's not, it doesn't have an irreversible tipping point, which is not to say it's not important. And things we've highlighted before, like the El Nino Southern Oscillation, Earth's history tells us it's unstable, but we don't 
currently think we've got enough uh, evidence to keep it on the, the tipping point map. Now, this is perhaps the more interesting summary, and this is our current information at, at what level of global warming, global mean surface temperature change above pre-industrial, do we think the tipping point resides for the global core tipping elements on the map or the regional impact tipping elements on the second map? And you'll see for each system, I'm sorry about the cryptic acronyms, but they're sort of explained up in the top right, we give a minimum estimate from the literature, which is where some model or models show a tipping point, um, a maximum estimate, the sort of highest temperature at which some model shows a tipping point, and then our best estimate in blue. And over on the right, I compare this to what are current, you know, what are the, what's the Paris Agreement goal to limit warming to one and a half degrees C, what are current policies leading us to about 2.9 degrees centigrade? If we follow, if nations follow their pledges and targets, what will we get? 2.4 degrees centigrade and so on. Well, the salient point is you see lots of tipping points that might be at risk at low levels of warming, including in the Paris Agreement range, and things just get, things just escalate above two degrees C. So systems come in to the list that, that wouldn't be threatened if we met the Paris Agreement, but would be threatened if we fail, like, like that five meters of sea level rise from East Antarctic subglacial basins, for example. Time's marching on, but I just wanted to finish up by saying a word about what do we know scientifically about the physical, uh, and if you like, biological or ecological impacts of, of passing these tipping points. Well, I've tried in the past to summarize our information on this, which is what this rather wordy table is about. But frankly, we need more research on the impacts of crossing tipping points. It has not been a major focus of research. And if we want a proper risk assessment and be properly equipped to deal with this, we desperately need to look at the impact side of the risk equation as well as the likelihood side. However, we have been studying the Atlantic overturning circulation or so-called AMOC collapse um, for, for some time as a scientific community. So let me say a little bit about uh, some of the profound impacts the collapse of the Atlantic overturning would have on the climate. Um, so what I'm showing here are some results from a forthcoming uh, OECD report that we've contributed to where we overlay um, a scenario for collapse of this Atlantic overturning circulation against the background of a two and a half degree warmer world, roughly where, you know, current pledges from nations would take us. So you've got to think about this as this is the end result of two things happening, a warming signal and then this tipping point <coughs> unfolding. And you've got to think, well, societies will be adapting to one change and then they'll have to try and adapt to a completely different direction of change if we go into this future. But you see, you know, the, uh, this overturning circulation collapse can counterbalance and over, over, override the warming in parts of the Northern Hemisphere and lead to net cooling. But perhaps most profoundly, it does extraordinary things to the global water cycle. We have a profound drying in the red stripe here and a profound wetting down here in the blue stripe. This is the intertropical convergence zone being shifted southwards. Major issues of disrupting or breaking the monsoons in West Africa and seriously reducing rainfall in India as well, as well as massive drying over Europe. We've done a little bit of work then to say, well, what does that do in terms of the sort of niche for growing the major staple crops? Wheat, maize and rice here. How does the suitability for growing those crops change in this combined warming and tipping point scenario? Purple is bad news, green is good news. Um, there's a lot of purple on the maps, especially for wheat and maize. We see some profound declines in suitability for, for wheat and maize growing and a sort of maybe mild net benefit for rice. But I'm afraid when you look down in the bottom right at the changes in the sort of proportions of suitable land, from the baseline scenario to collapsing the overturning circulation to adding on the climate signal, well, the big declines for wheat and maize far outweigh the slight possible gains for rice. And you see that the, the climate tipping point and the global warming uh, are not counterbalancing each other, they're confounding each other, they're putting a double whammy hit on, on the two st major staple crops, wheat and maize. 
And if you're curious about trying to boil this down to a national scale, we've done a bit of work on that at the, sorry to be parochial, uh, but at the GB scale, where, where thanks to my colleagues in Exeter, we have a pretty sophisticated uh, econometric model of uh, UK farming decisions and land use. Uh, so much of the so UK has arable farming in brown over in the east, uh, grassland pasture farming in green over much of the rest of the country. If we pass a climate tipping point, it's not the fact that it gets colder that's the problem. It's the fact that it gets pr profoundly drier. We predict basically Tim? an elimination of arable farming. Team, so, two yeah, more minutes. I'm I'm done, Lawrence, nearly. So that's just to back up at the at the national scale what the, the global is consistent with the global picture. So that leads me to reflect a little bit on other studies in the literature. So some other studies in the literature, uh, econo economic studies, have come to the conclusion that shutting down this Atlantic overturning circulation, also called the thermohaline circulation, could be good for human welfare. We find modest but by and large positive effects on human welfare, according to this group. I have to, I have to also reflect that what Simon's going to talk about in a minute in their model, uh, they also find the benefit of slowdown of the Atlantic overturning. It reduces the expected social, expected social cost of carbon by reducing damaging warming in some countries. But I'm afraid uh, this, I cannot reconcile this results with what I've just shown you. And we have to be asking in cases like this, with these important issues, does, do, does even the sign of change there pass the smell test? Does it really make sense that a collapse of the Atlantic overturning could be net economically beneficial? I hope what I've shown you would lead you also to the conclusion that it, it might be net rather detrimental. So to summarize, um, I've hopefully given you a hint that uh, observations and dynamic early warning signals are showing us that we're dangerously close to some climate tipping points. Major ice sheets are at risk, even at one and a half degrees C of warming, and things just escalate from going from one and a half to two degrees C of warming, and, and the risk increases markedly above two degrees C. So we certainly need to urgently better assess the impacts of these climate tipping points. Thanks. Thank you, um, Tim. The calm, you know, the, the uh, uh, how moved you sound by the end of the world you're announcing to us is very striking. I mean, I certainly got really uh, alarmed by what you were saying. So I hope that Elizabeth will be able to shed some light on how, how we should look at it from an economic standpoint and make a case to act fast. Uh, thanks, Tim. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for inviting me to join this really interesting workshop. Um, I'm very happy to see it happening. Um, so now that we've been thoroughly depressed by Tim Linton's fabulous presentation, um, you know, I'm going to take a step back before you hear in the next session about kind of the newest uh, economic modeling efforts of tipping elements. Um, I'm going to step back and think, okay, well, let's just review how tipping points have or mostly have not been incorporated into economic analysis, um, drawing primarily on a now outdated review of the literature that some colleagues and I had done. Um, so think of this as kind of reviewing where we have been to set the stage for uh, the newer studies you'll hear about in the next session. Okay, I'm not able to advance my slides right now. Oh, now it's going. Okay, so tipping points have generally entered policy discussions through a concern about catastrophic climate change. You know, you hear this in the academic discourse and in policy. Um, Bob Pindyke, for example, has several times he'll focus on you know, the potential for catastrophic impacts due to climate change is the most important aspect for determining uh, what level of response government should take. Um, and if we had to make any kind of economic case for stringent abatement policy, it really has to be um, based on the possibility of this catastrophic outcome. So it's perhaps not surprising then that economic analyses of climate change are often criticized for failing to adequately capture um, possible catastrophic impacts. Um, if you think, think about it, okay, of course, how much this matters depends on what kind of policy analysis we're doing, okay? It's one thing to incorporate tipping points and uncertainty into a briefing 
uh, for governments to try to make the broader case for taking policy action as soon as possible. But it's quite a different challenge to figure out how to incorporate tipping points into uh, analyses of greenhouse gas mitigation benefits or to adaptation policies, et cetera. Because we, for that, you know, we really need to know, we have to understand whether, for example, a ton of CO2 emissions in 2030 contributes to the passing of that tipping point and also how, when, and where economic damages will manifest thereafter. Um, that's going to really matter for things like estimates of the social cost of carbon and other greenhouse gases. And so it's primarily in that policy context that I'm, I started taking a harder look at, at this issue. Um, and that's because, you know, during the, the um, Obama administration's effort to bring some rigor to the uh, estimation of social costs of greenhouse gas estimates. Um, you know, during that process, there was often discussion about whether or not catastrophic impacts were included, not included in estimates. Um, and it caused many of us to think, well, what exactly are we talking about here? Um, you know, you see various terms, at least in, in policy discussions and uh, different types of papers you're talking about, uh, they're used to describe these kinds of system dynamics. We have abrupt changes, critical threshold, regime shifts, tipping points, surprises, discontinuities, all of these perhaps leading to catastrophic events. But this kind of imprecise and, and nebulous inconsistent terminology, I think really complicated, complicates discussions of how these complex uh, phenomena can be better incorporated into our damage estimates. So a couple of colleagues and I took, uh, decided to take a harder look at this issue um, after that, that first development of the US social costs of carbon estimates were, were issued. And we wanted to really have a better understanding of how different disciplines were thinking about this as a starting point for how we could improve estimates into the future. And overall, you know, for our purposes, at least we were a bit disappointed. You know, we found the literature not yet useful uh, for providing insights regarding the magnitude of expected welfare effects um, of these potential catastrophes to really um, be able to see how it would affect estimates of the social cost of carbon. And we found that that was primarily because the uniform way in which economic studies had tried to model such impacts um, resulted in, in modeling of events that don't really resemble uh, the ones of concern that Tim uh, just talked about. Um, so I'm happy to see that there's been a lot of research since that time and increased collaboration between economists and physical scientists. And so I think this workshop is an excellent way to showcase where some of that progress has been made. And I know we'll hear about that in the next um, session. So I'm gonna take you back a little bit and just tell you about where we, we were at least um, eight years ago um, when we took a look at this. Um, in our 2013 paper and first considered how um, the term catastrophic impact was used in the scientific literature and uh, contrasted that with the way the economic literature had modeled potential uh, economic and human welfare impacts of, of events of this nature. And then to lay the foundation for kind of improving things going forward, we conducted a review from an economic perspective of 15 tipping points, uh, tipping elements that, you know, Tim identified in his nice 2008 review. Um, and so, of course, please keep in mind that this was done from the perspective of an economist. It was not intended to be any kind of assessment of the, the technical merits of particular studies. Um, so the first thing we, we know right away is that, um, oh, I should, sorry, I'm not on the right slide. Um, down, is that we rarely found catastrophic terminology really used in the scientific literature. Physical scientists often um, use the phrase abrupt climate change. And one often cited definition is an abrupt climate change occurs when the climate system is forced to cross some threshold, triggering a transition to a new state at a rate determined 
by the climate system itself and faster than the cause. And I think that's very consistent with the nice movie that, that Tim showed us a little while ago. And so there, there was various definitions in the literature, but the three most salient aspects of it that we pulled out was that the change occurs relatively quickly. It causes a natural system to move to a new steady state and potentially results in a relatively large impact. But one thing that I think is really important to keep in mind is a change occurring relatively quickly to um, when talking about <coughs> a particular or system change could, has been used to describe things that happen in a, over a couple of years, several decades, hundreds of years, or even um, would take like a millennium to uh, reach their new, their new transition, their new steady state. Um, so that is, um, that is something to, to think about carefully. Um, and we also found that the IPCC had in the past used potentially confusing terminology when they talk about large scale discontinuities to describe some, some events um, because the notion of a discontinuity in this case arises from observing the time path of the system over a long time horizon. It's not necessarily a mathematical discontinuity um, in the way that, um, so the next, and as we know the climate change related events described in this matter in climate science literature um, is often associated with crossing a threshold in the earth system or a tipping point after which a small perturbation in radiative forcing would result in, in a, a larger change in the climate system. Um, and so many of this literature is focused on which systems are most vulnerable to tipping points, how soon those thresholds will be crossed or passed, and what's the full impact um, of the transition to a new state. Um, and this basically consists of three basic elements, as Tim so nicely described, of a trigger, an amplifier, and then a source of persistence making uh, the new state stable and self-reinforcing and, and perhaps irreversible. Um, but this is not to say that impacts the system will not occur prior to crossing that threshold. We're already going to see some uh, large scale changes before those thresholds um, are crossed. Now let's think about how did the economics literature at the time really translate these tipping elements into their studies. Um, and what we found is that the economic use of catastrophe really commonly describes a permanent and instantaneous regime shift that lowers welfare and occurs with a low probability. Um, and there's theoretical work, not necessarily for climate, that started thinking about this uh, back in the 70s by Maureen Cropper when she's thinking about showing the importance of including low probability but potentially high impact catastrophic events in an economic uh, modeling framework. Um, and, and then in the climate economics literature, uh, climate change economics literature, um, there are studies that hard, had started to reflect them with in quantitative analysis of climate change, usually with the use of integrated assessment models. Now, integrated assessment models, of course, very uh, highly aggregated, reduced form representations of the complex interactions between natural and, and human or economic systems. Um, and many of the ways that many of these IAM studies modeled very generic climate catastrophes abstracted from the specifics of the natural science um, of such events. And of course, there was some sophistication uh, there's some variation in the sophistication of these modeling efforts, but for the most part, the link between economic welfare and the potential high impact natural event was left uh, vague and relatively underdeveloped. Um, the welfare impacts are still primarily modeled as an instantaneous and permanent uh, in the event of a catastrophe. Um, now, a few papers did start to already adjust that to allow welfare effects to phase in over time, um, but the arrival rate and resulting welfare in changes were still 
relatively chosen ad hoc. Um, and these papers found that catastrophes have large policy impacts, um, but it's still just a very high, highly stylized um, uh, studies. So how this matches scientific data on the likelihood, impact, and timing of large-scale climate events was rarely evaluated. And the linkage between natural system changes and welfare impacts appears to almost never be carefully developed. Um, Hume, way back in 20, 2003, um, I think correctly stated that no estimates for the welfare loss of the Atlantic thermohaline shutdown um, are rooted in substantive uh, environmental, economic, or social research. And I think him has also been saying uh, this for over a decade now, that research of impacts of passing climate tipping points is, is urgently needed. Um, so the rest of our paper then was trying to get a handle, okay, well, how um, does this representation of catastrophes match the scientific evidence and the likely economic impacts. And so we reviewed um, 15 uh, large scale earth system changes due to climate change. And we found uh, considerable variation in many characteristics across these 15 tipping elements. And I'm sure this is outdated already now as Tim <laughs> has told us, but I'm just gonna kind of walk you through the flavor of our exercise to give you a sense of how um, economists, I think, should start thinking about this. And to some degree, I already see it happening in the literature um, so that we ha can have better representation of these elements. So we found there was considerable variation in the likelihood of a tipping point behavior, the warming needed to pass a critical threshold, the geographic extent of impacts, the transition time scales, the types of physical and economic impacts, okay? As we saw from Tim's presentation, some changes are primarily a direct result of increasing temperature, while others hinge on changes in precipitation patterns, ocean temperature gradients, or combination of complex mechanisms. Um, but uh, none appear to result in a discontinuous permanent loss in welfare once a threshold is crossed. Um, Regardless of the degree of certainty of the existence of the tipping point, the location of the threshold, we can still expect to see important large scale changes um, within this century and, uh, and before the threshold is crossed. And those are not being well captured in, uh, or weren't at the time of our review in, in IAMs. Um, <clears throat> And we also found that not all tipping points are, of course, of considered low probability events, um, at least at the time of this 2008 review by Lenton, you know, you show that there was a high probability that several will be crossed in this century. And I think, if anything, that has only uh, increased since that time. Um, so here is the list of the 15 tipping elements that we looked at and a summary of what was known about the likely um, warming threshold, time, transition time scale, uh, relative likelihood of occurring an impact at the time that we did our review. So I know this is outdated, so there's no point in going through the specifics of each one. But the important question is, given the wide variation in the types of potential climate quote, catastrophes, which of these possible events are the most feasible and more, most important to start better representing in uh, integrated assessment models. Again, thinking of the ones that are used to estimate things like the social cost of greenhouse gases. And I think categorizations or rankings provided in the scientific literature or scientific review articles are a useful first cut, um, but we should also think a little bit beyond that when we're uh, prioritizing IAM modeling efforts um, because Potential events that require significant warming or multi-century transition times and a low likelihood of occurring are perhaps less likely produ to produce significant near-term economic damages than those that have low tem temperature thresholds or short transition times and are less uncertain. So that's one 
thing to keep in mind. Um, so then the next thing we did was to take a closer look at each event to try to help prioritize which ones, uh, again, at the time, were, were the most feasible to initially uh, analyze in economic models. And so we're really focusing in on do, what do we know about the types of physical endpoints that would be impacted and the degree of scientific consensus around how these impacts would likely unfold and their Elizabeth? transition time scales. Yes. Elizabeth, two minutes. Okay, two minutes. Okay, I'll hurry. Um, and just note that by consensus here, we are really talking about a general understanding of which physical impact endpoints would be impacted and in what direction uh, the impact would be on those endpoints, right? So there's pretty good scientific evidence consensus that the melting of the ice sheets are going to uh, increase sea level, right? That's the type of thing. Whereas for some of these, even, uh, even the direction of change on physical endpoints wasn't that, uh, there wasn't as much consensus yet. Um, and then in moving to move forward, we tried to assess at the time, um, you know, which of the, what physical endpoints uh, would be affected the most through which economic consequences are most likely to be experienced. So this table summarizes um, at the time of our assessment, these key endpoints grouped into five general categories. So which ones are going to affect changes in temperature directly or from additional feedbacks? which will affect sea level rise, precipitation, um, extreme events, or some other categories. And the shaded cells indicated which of these had received the most attention by scientists at that time, um, either because they're expected to produce the largest, most significant source of uh, damages, or because more was known at that time about how the physical uh, impacts would evolve. And so if you think about current, even current integrated assessment models, you know, for the most part, their, um, their damage functions are still generally based on changes in temperature and sea level rise. But now at least some of those are, you have country level damage functions. So if we could do even just a better job of um, incorporating these elements into the simple climate models that give projections of regional or even more downscale temperature changes, um, sea level rise, that would be like an obvious low hanging fruit that could already be incorporated into um, or at coupled with existing damage functions. Then for other things here, you know, there is need to not only um, improve the physical uh, modeling within these kinds of IAMs, but then also to translate those physical changes into welfare effects. So um, these types of integrated assessment models, for example, do not yet have damage functions for uh, showing how changes in precipitation patterns will affect certain economic damage categories. Um, so that is where more research is really needed. And I know I am out of time. So just to kind of re recap some of the takeaways from our old, um, old study is that we really have to move away from what we saw in the early literature of the economics community kind of interpreting scientifically abrupt climate change to mean instantaneous change in welfare in this kind of ad hoc way, because that is not to be policy relevant. We, we can't continue to just assume an ad hoc percent reduction in consumption if uh, event Y occurs. Um, and of course, the irres or irreversibility associated with crossing tipping points and uncertainties associated with the location will also have important policy implications. Um, but to conclude, I don't. I think there's there's a lot that can be done here, and we're already seeing um, a great deal of progress being made. I think over the past decade, and so I'm interested and, and can't wait to hear more from those researchers in the next session. Sorry for going over. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful introduction. Um, we, we're very lucky to have you two um, opening this conference. And, and I will abuse uh, the fact that I'm, I'm the chair, especially given that there have been questions in the chat. 
uh, which have been answered to ask myself to question. Um, the first one to team. Um, so I'm, I know we're tipping point, we're discussing tipping points. So at some stage, something becomes massive and, and you know, has um, possibly irreversible damage. Um, but when we look at your modeling, we find things which happen by 2100, which for any policymaker is very far away and not extremely stimulating, especially when this would require taking some unpopular measure. And I was wondering if, if, if in your area, people were modeling the distribution of the probability of tipping point. And for example, if we could say like by 2030, we have a 40% chance uh, that something like that happened. And if you could give us a bit of, of detail on this. And I'll ask a question to Elizabeth as well to leave you time to prepare, which, um, um, so, so here people uh, would be super happy to have listened to you discussing welfare and not GDP uh, when it comes to the damages created by uh, tipping points. And I was also uh, super interesting. It was very interesting to, um, to listen to this and, and I would have the a similarly quantitative questions but on a difficult, on a different topic. How can you give us a broad range of what are the losses of welfare that you have estimated? Um, and, and what condition the variation in, in this range. And, and I'm asking the question because one of the things we hear a lot when discussing modeling is our baseline scenario are too optimistic. Um, and, and we don't manage to trigger the same as the 2800 for our team. You know, we are not going to alarm any policymaker by telling them that uh, the welfare loss is 4% in 50 years. Um, in that case, you know. Let, let's leave it to the next generation. Um, so if, if we could have your estimate, that would be, or a range of estimate, that would be great. Um, team. Yeah, thanks, Lawrence. So I'm actually in the middle of an exercise kind of trying to answer your question. So based on those new temperature threshold estimates and uncertainty ranges and some uh, justification for what prior to put on those, we've basically been looking at okay, um, what could be avoided uh, and what could be passed in the near term in terms of tipping points? And we find, interestingly, quite a separation between a, a meeting the Paris Agreement low warming trajectory and a sort of carrying on current trends or just meeting, going to two or three degrees warming current policy trajectory. We actually find that, uh, that several tipping points could be crossed with significant probabilities. And I've hinted at what some of those are vis-a-vis -vis the ice sheets um, in the 2030s. But crucially, we found, whilst there's still some risk of those on the, on the low warming Paris Agreement trajectory for the reasons that I outlined, there's a whole lot of other tipping points that you then start crossing on the current policies trajectory in the 2040s to 2050s. Um, or even earlier that you avoid on the low warming threshold, uh, low warming trajectory. So that was a little, that was quite striking. And I need to, I mean, it's not published yet. Um, there's, of course, you've got an internal variability in the climate. So it's almost surprising that you see the scenarios able to separate out that quickly. But uh, that's what we found so far. So I'll keep, keep trying to answer your questions. Of course, you might retort, well, you know, uh, the ice sheet is melting slowly, but crucially, once it's going and it's self-accelerating, you've kicked in a steeper rate of sea level rise and a steeper rate of adaptation challenges and all those damages. So that's what we have to remind other policymakers about, even if it looks like a slow tipping element, once it, you know, once it's going irreversibly and accelerating, you've, you've certainly um, ex uh, accelerated the arrival of the impacts. So Thank I'll you. Elizabeth answer. Thank you. And I look forward to see some kind of chronology with the probability. Um, Elizabeth, sorry. I, yeah, thanks for your question. So back in when we looked at this in 2013, we did not um, pull out the range of uh, welfare impact estimates from the studies that we looked at. And even if I had those at my fingertips, I don't know if I would really rely on those at this point, given their outdated nature. Um, you know, I'm involved right now with 
uh, doing some of the technical work behind the forthcoming update of the US government social cost of greenhouse gas estimates that was um, called for in President Biden's executive order last January. Um, you know, that will give us um, some range of estimates uh, of the marginal benefit of reducing emissions um, going forward. Um, but I think perhaps we'll hear more in the next session from Simon Dietz on, on their uh, most recent paper um, that, that looks at uh, the impact of incorporating um, several tipping points at once on uh, in welfare analysis. So uh, I'll leave it to him to answer your question in more detail. <laughs> No, it made me scared when you said the impact of several tipping points. I think, you know, after team presentation, which was already um, alarming enough, if we if we start combining them, I guess the welfare losses are going to be uh, tremendous. But it's, I mean, it's, uh, I'm sure you agree that there's nothing better than a good number to actually trigger a reaction with a, with a policymaker. Um, which is why I was yeah. thinking about But this. I think it's important to keep in mind that the damage functions that have been developed to try to estimate the, the economic impacts, the damages, whether those be market damages or non-market damages, they're still also very conservative. They're missing a lot of things. So um, I think it's fair to say that most estimates out there, unless they're making ad hoc assumptions, um, are... Are, are still not going to be capturing the full extent of damage. I have to back Elizabeth up on that. It's it's just not credible to have a bunch of models that are using sort of changes in global mean temperature uh, and pretend that they're even remotely capturing all, all of the impacts and damages we get from tipping points, as I hopefully my overturning circulation example illustrates. We really have to do better than that, you know start with a water cycle, start with considering radical changes in seasonality and extreme events. And, and reality has just been showing us some of those extreme events during the last six months or so. I know, so I agree with you. Um, I also think, for example, if you look at what happened in Germany over last summer, uh, sorry, I think we're taking time on the others, but just to finish here and to explain uh, where I come from, uh, or you look, for example, at some of the hurricane in the US, then it's very difficult at a macro level to tell a policymaker, look, look what this is, you know, uh, costing, because at the end of the day, uh, in terms of GDP, this will be not as striking as one would hope to get a policy reaction, as I'm sure um, as I'm sure you know, and, and which is why the welfare side is also important because no, it's, it's not only about the tiny GDP number, it's about people being hurt and affected by it. Um, but I think, um, and I appreciate also what Elizabeth was saying, I think we, we, we have to continue to build up the narrative um, with modeling and with scenarios which are more and more realistic and also which talk about welfare as much as GDP to make it um, impactful on the policymaker. With that, I would love to continue discussing this. Uh, it's very frustrating not to have more time. So Shardul, I don't thank you, but nevertheless, uh, the floor is yours. And thanks to Tim and Elizabeth for a fantastic presentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Laurence, and, and thanks to, uh, to Tim and Elizabeth uh, for, uh, for the excellent presentations. So now I'm pleased to welcome you to session two of this workshop uh, on economic modeling of climate and related tipping points. Uh, I'd like to note that we have roughly 300 participants connected right now. There were almost 550 participants registered from around the world, including from China, India, Chile, even Fiji. Um, if not a record, this must at least be a significant outlier for a subject as dry and technical as climate economy modeling. Uh, I think it's both a testament to the timeliness of the topic and the high caliber of the experts who have agreed to participate over these two days. So coming to the focus of this session, uh, how, when, and where economic damages will manifest from biophysical climatic changes is 
central to determining mitigation and adaptation policies. And of course, also for uh, benefit cost analysis of uh, specific regulatory or non-regulatory policy instruments through the social cost of carbon. This is a point that uh, Elizabeth made uh, quite eloquently in her presentation. And within this universe of economic damages, uh, the potential for catastrophic impacts in the climate system is definitely the most important aspect in terms of determining optimal policy. And this is the point uh, uh, Robert Pindyk, uh, Martin Weitzman, and others have made uh, in the past in the climate economics literature. But as again, as Elizabeth said, something often gets lost in translation when the information on the biophysical aspects of tipping points gets incorporated into integrated assessment models. Um, among other things, uh, tipping points have often been treated in isolation without considering interactions. Uh, the welfare losses are often ad hoc and Economic models have historically not been able to capture the timescales, the dynamics, and the uncertainties associated with the underlying biophysical processes of climate tipping points. And that provides the context uh, for this session. We'll take a deeper dive into recent advances. So since Elizabeth's paper in the integrated assessment modeling of economic consequences of tipping points in the climate system. And here, uh, we're going to start in reverse chronological order. Uh, so the first presentation uh, is, is actually the most recent uh, paper hot off the press just uh, out two months ago in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. And this paper is by Simon Dietz and co-authors from the London School of Economics. Uh, this paper uh, has a very ambitious uh, goal. It is to develop unified estimates of eight prominent climate tipping points that have been covered uh, piecemeal in the economics literature using a meta-analytic integrated assessment model. After that, we have two intertwined presentations by Yongyang Kai from Ohio State University and Christian Traeger from the University of Oslo, who in a series of papers over the past decade or so, have incorporated climate tipping points through a stochastic or a DSGE type extension of the Nordhaus Dynamic Integrated Climate Economy DICE model. Uh, such a model setup is used to study questions such as optimal policy in the face of multiple interacting climate tipping points. And, and, and Yong Yai and Christian would be explaining uh, uh, both the rationale of the modeling frameworks, but also some of the key insights from that. And last but not the least, we will go to where climate economy modeling all began three decades ago to Bill Nordhaus from Yale, who will be joining us in the middle of the session uh, to offer his reflections on modeling the economic consequences of climate tipping points. But he'll also be talking about climate triggered nonlinearities in the socioeconomic system. And from his perspective, what some of the key open issues are for modeling and research. And the second half of Bill's presentation would feed very nicely into session three tomorrow, which would be focusing on precisely that. This is the climate related tipping points in socioeconomic systems. So um, that's the sketch of this session. Uh, in terms of process, each speaker would be speaking for roughly uh, 15 to 16 minutes. And uh, time permitting, I'll, I might throw one or two questions of clarification right at the end of each presentation, but we do hope to have ample time for a discussion uh, amongst the panelists and also a Q&A once all presentations have been made. And you can at any time put your questions in uh, the Q&A and we will be tracking them and uh, feed them to the panelists uh, at, at the appropriate moment. So uh, now it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Simon Dietz. Uh, Simon is an environmental economist with particular interest in climate change and sustainable development. He's published research on a wide range of topics uh, and works with governments, businesses, and NGOs on topics of shared interest, such as carbon pricing, institutional investment, and insurance. He is a professor of environmental policy uh, in the Grantham Institute on Climate Change and Environment and the Department of Geography and Environment at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He's also co-editor of the Journal of uh, the Association of Environmental and Resource Economists 
and has uh, a number of other uh, distinguished positions. So Simon, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Shardo. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can. Okay, well, uh, and hello everyone. Thanks so much for having me uh, here today. So I'm just gonna try and share my screen. I uh, hope you can see that, and I hope you can now see it full screen. Um, so, so uh, as uh, as Shardo mentioned, this is uh, uh, this is a paper that was published a few weeks ago in PNAS, and it's joint work with James Rising, Thomas Sturck, who's here in the audience today, and Gernot Wagner. Um, now, I usually uh, introduce the talk by uh, talking about tipping points and why they're important, but I, I don't need to do that today because um, Tim and um, Elizabeth did such a great job. So instead, I'm going to go straight into uh, discussing the economic literature on climate tipping points. So at the outset of this study, we did a systematic literature review. Uh, and you won't be surprised to know that most studies in climate economics ignore climate tipping points, or at most they have very indirect or partial coverage of them, for example, loosely motivating a, 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 a convex damage function. But we did find 52 papers that explicitly model the economic consequences of at least one climate tipping point. So, so that's not a, a trivial literature, especially in a field like economics, where we don't publish very often relative to, uh, say, the sciences. Um, but the trouble is that the majority of these papers uh, model climate tipping points and their economic consequences in a highly stylized way. And, and Elizabeth really touched on this in her talk. So a typical example would be you posit uh, uh, the existence of a tipping point, you cross it with a probability, and then when you cross it, there's a 30% reduction in global GDP, which uh, is a, an ad hoc assumption. Now, th these, these studies are, are useful. Uh, they help answer questions like, suppose crossing a tipping point causes an economic catastrophe, what then is the best policy response, both ex ante and ex post? But clearly you can't answer questions like, what actually are the economic impacts of crossing climate tipping points with models where the impacts are ad hoc? For that second category of question, there is a, 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 an emerging literature uh, which tries to model um, uh, climate tipping points, uh, building on what we call in our paper geophysical foundations. That means that they have at least a reduced form representation of the key underlying geophysical relationships. So what do I mean by this? Well, I'm, I, I think one of the clearest examples of this is uh, Bill Nordhaus's 2019 paper in PNAS on economics of the disintegration of the Greenland ice sheet. In that paper, he builds a, a reduced form model, uh, some people call it an emulator, um, to study uh, melting of the Greenland ice sheet. And, and critically, that model can be meaningfully calibrated on much bigger underlying studies in, 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 in the ice sheet modeling literature and then inserted in his integrated assessment model DICE uh, to hopefully come up with some kind of physically realistic estimate of uh, the economic impacts of Greenland melting through sea level rise. In other words, the impacts of melting on sea level rise and then on the economy. Okay, so we've got all these, we've got these 21 studies. So what's the problem? Well, as Shardul mentioned, the literature is, is uh, I'm going to put it in my own words, it's fragmented. So each of these papers typically uh, takes a, a particular integrated assessment model like DICE or FUND or PAGE, and then it studies an individual tipping point with that model. And because it's a fragmented literature, there are no unified estimates existing with geophysical foundations of the economic impacts of climate tipping points. And as I think Elizabeth also said, it's, it's partly because of this that climate tipping points tend to get excluded from key economic studies and policy processes. For example, the, the 2006 Stern Review, which I worked on, uh, and, and um, the, the US federal social cost of carbon as it currently is. So that sets the scene for what we tried to do in, in this paper. So we tried to produce unified estimates of the economic impacts of, of climate tipping points. Uh, it's a literature synthesis, this paper, and it tries to synthesize the, the studies that uh, in our view are geophysically realistic. 
and it tries to estimate the impacts of crossing tipping points using uh, what I would perhaps characterize as modern uh, estimates of the economic impacts of climate and weather. Now, to do this, um, we can't just rely on traditional modes of literature synthesis. So we couldn't just uh, assemble the underlying papers, extract numbers from the papers and add them together. And there are two reasons why we couldn't do that. Um, the first is that the, the numbers, it would have been like adding apples and oranges in the sense that the numbers were derived from different IAMs run under different boundary conditions with different parameterizations, for example, importantly, different discount rates, and also even reported inconsistent welfare metrics. So some papers reporting marginal damages, some papers reporting total damages, this kind of thing. The other reason why you can't just extract numbers and add them up uh, is the possible interaction effects between tipping points, which both Tim and Elizabeth spoke about. So our approach was to build a, a so-called meta-analytic IAM. What do we mean by that? Well, it's an IAM in its own right. So if you, if you keep all the tipping points off, so to speak, it will produce you an estimate of the social cost of carbon and other important um, economic variables. Um, it has a modular structure which um, recent work by the US National Academies has identified as being a, 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 the right way forward for IAMs so that different models can be taken out and put in. And, and the way tipping points figure into this model is that each of the studies in the literature that we're synthesizing in our paper, we're going to build an exact replica of the physical tipping module in that study and then we're going to insert it in our meta-analytical IAM, okay? So that we can try to come up with an estimate of the overall impact of different climate tipping points and do so in a consistent manner. Let me just say, so, uh, make a few very brief comments about the model. It's a short talk, so obviously I can't show you the guts of it. But what I do want to show you are the eight climate tipping points that we cover in the paper. You can see them here in the table. Um, <clears throat> the first three are essentially positive feedbacks in the climate system, which uh, could increase the eventual amount of temperature change that you get for a given impulse of greenhouse gas emissions. The fourth, Amazon dieback, uh, we could classify as biome change. It's important to note that in our study, the only aspect of Amazon dieback that we were able to include is the carbon cycle feedback. So in a way, conceptually, it's also modeled as a positive feedback in the climate system. That's not to say that Amazon dieback won't have much more far reaching consequences. It's just that the study we are synthesizing uh, was only able to look at the carbon cycle feedback part. Five and six are our melting of the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets. And seven and eight are changes in the circulation. AMOC is the Atlantic overturning circulation. And the last one is the Indian summer monsoon. So what we've got here are eight climate tipping points and 11 separate studies. And as I said, we're going to replicate these studies. And it's an important principle we adhered to that we exactly replicated them. We didn't override them because we thought we could do it better. We only added to them where it was necessary. As far as the, the, the wider uh, IAM is concerned, it's, it's in, it, it, it does the job of an IAM. So it, it contains a mapping from emissions to changes in physical climate variables and then a set of damage functions which relates that back to economic impacts. Um, very briefly, here are some of the particular features of the model. Uh, firstly, the emissions growth and population scenarios are exogenous, and they come from the IPCC's uh, RCP SSP scenario suite. So we're, we're not trying to optimize global emissions in this study. We're just running scenarios through the model. Um, the climate model is called FAIR, and it's very widely used in climate science as a, as a, as a reduced form model uh, of temperature change as an emulator, which uh, emulates more complex CMIT models. Um, we don't work with global mean temperature. Uh, for damages, we disaggregate to the national level for each of 180 countries, and we do that through 
pattern or statistical downscaling of global temperature to national mean temperature. Temperature damages are based on recent empirical results. So we're leveraging this new literature in climate econometrics, in particular, the study by Burke, Shang and Miguel in Nature. Similarly, sea level rise damages are based on high resolution modeling using the CAM and DIVA models and databases. So this breaks the world's coastlines down into more than 12,000 individual segments based on their topography, uh, population, economic assets at risk, and then simulates damages from sea level rise, also taking into account potential adaptive responses. There's the option to add into the model non-market damages based on the merge model, because of course the, the, the climate econometrics results uh, are, uh, just relate to market impacts. And lastly, we have a sort of flexible parametric specification, which allows us to look at different ways in which climate damages affect the growth process, ranging from a model in which they solely affect the level of growth to a model in which they solely affect the growth rate or are in other words, perfectly persistent. Okay, so I show you some results. So this, uh, what I'm showing you here is the effect of these eight tipping points individually and collectively on the social cost of carbon. In other words, the marginal damage cost of a ton of CO2. And collectively, they increase uh, the social cost of carbon by about 25%, of which the two largest contributors are the permafrost carbon feedback, PCF, and ocean methane hydrate dissociation, OMH. Uh, the other effects are individually smaller. A couple of them are negative. The first is the surface albedo feedback. The reason why that's negative is essentially an artifact. Standard IEMs uh, assume a constant equilibrium climate sensitivity of which the surface albedo feedback is a part. In reality, the surface albedo feedback won't be constant. It'll be stronger in the short term and weaker in the long term when all the ice is melted. And what these results suggest is that relative to a constant equilibrium climate sensitivity, the social cost of carbon is slightly reduced. The other negative effect, which Tim mentioned in his talk, is of the Atlantic overturning circulation. In a way, this just obviously projects the, the results of the underlying study we're synthesizing here, Antoff, Estrada, and Toll. Um, their study only takes into account the temperature effects of AMOC slowdown. And so I have no quarrel with Tim's um, argument that this underestimates the, the impact of um, AMOC slowdown on the social cost of carbon. I'm quite happy to uh, sign up to that claim. Now, Typically, when I present this paper, uh, people, uh, uh, many people are surprised that these numbers aren't larger. So I think it's probably a good idea if I address this point now. So first of all, uh, I want to put these numbers in context and suggest that actually they're not small. So an extra $15 on a ton of CO2 in 2020 would easily add up to more than, a tr uh, or, or uh, uh, between half a trillion and a trillion dollars on the total cost of climate change in 2020. Secondly, uh, a social cost of carbon of $65 implies an optimal uh, global carbon tax of $65 a tonne of CO2. If we had that, we would comfortably limit global warming to well below two degrees, okay? so I'm would argue it's not a small number. Secondly, as I'll come back to in a moment, the studies that we're synthesizing miss out a lot. Okay, so uh, we, we say in the paper that our numbers are probable underestimates. I mean, logically we can't be sure, but they very probably are. By how much is anybody's guess. But thirdly, another reason why these numbers might look small to you is that what I'm reporting to you here is a sort of measure of central tendency the difference in the expected social cost of carbon. So if I now show you the underlying distribution of percentage changes in the social cost of carbon, you can see that a lot of the time the increase is in the order of 20, 30, maybe 40%. But this distribution has this long tail where tipping points collectively could increase the social cost of carbon by a lot. So on the basis of this distribution, which we derive through a mixture of Monte Carlo simulation and combining 
scenarios in a fractional factorial design, we estimate about a 10% chance that these eight climate tipping points could double the social cost of carbon and about a 5% chance that they could triple it. Okay. So in a way, what you saw on the previous slide is, is just the effect of not looking at the underlying distribution. The distribution is skewed. There is this long tail. It may or may not technically be a fat tail, but anyway, it evokes the Marty Weitzman story about risk and the motivations for climate action. Simon, two minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, just say something about the, the national level effects. So the, I'm showing you here a the, the social cost of carbon at the country level, typical results of sort of hot equatorial and subtropical countries being most affected, higher latitude countries less affected. The tipping points seem to increase the social cost of carbon everywhere, and they don't seem to materially affect the inequality in the social cost of carbon as measured by, say, what you can see here, Lorentz curves and uh, Gini coefficients. So essentially, everybody seems to share in the suffering of climate tipping points. So let me just wrap up. So the eight tipping points we think synthesize increase the social cost of carbon by about 25%. Um, but that's a, 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 a measure of central tendency from a distribution. And we estimate about a 10% chance of tipping points more than doubling the social cost of carbon. So tipping points increase global economic risk. A spatial analysis shows the increased losses almost everywhere and don't seem to have an effect on heterogeneity or inequality. I just want to finish up with really amplifying this last point. So given missing tipping points, missing damage processes and so on, I would certainly agree that you should see our numbers as probable underestimates, but they are at least hopefully a step forward in the sense of trying to model the impacts of tipping points in a more realistic manner. Here are some of the things that are missing. So, so some tipping points are missing. Um, some, uh, some tipping point interactions are missing. Uh, some climate, some uh, uh, impacts of tipping points that we do include are missing. For example, as I mentioned, the only impacts of Amazon dieback we've got are the, 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 the extra carbon released. And linking back to Tim's talk, the only effects of AMOC slowdown that we've included uh, are the temperature effects. Some of the tipping points we cover are subject to large uncertainties, particularly ocean methane hydrates. And of course, lastly, our integrated assessment model just plays into the whole debate and controversy about integrated assessment models and some of their key relationships. Okay, so, um, so that's it for the talk. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and I'm very pleased to pass back to you, Shardul. I'll just uh, stop sharing now. Thanks very much, uh, Simon, for that presentation. Um, let me uh, let me just pose one modeling question because the uh, you, you incorporated uh, eight tipping points and and, and modeling previous modeling studies, uh, which looked at the consequences of those tipping points. The majority of them were process based studies, so they were IMs linked to some kind of a biophysical model, I assume, or a reduced form version. But there were also some uh, survival analysis type of studies, uh, which are fundamentally different. Uh, I'm just wondering if there were any concerns about uh, merging uh, these two approaches into one modeling framework. Uh, for example, I think the Greenland ice sheet was a process-based model and the West Antarctic was a survival analysis. So does that affect your results in some way? Well, it, given that we're running exogenous emission scenarios through and then we're integrating over the uncertainty, actually the differences between the process based and the, uh, approach and survival analysis kind of uh, go away to a degree. So this would be more an issue if you were, if you were for example, optimizing uh, and perhaps Yong Yang will talk more about this because then the, the, the possibility that um, a tipping event is discrete uh, can matter a lot. What I will say, I mean, I think this is a really interesting sort of substantive modeling point, because although the, the study uh, of the West Antarctic ice sheet that we sent, that we included uh, modeled it as a, as a tipping event using survival analysis, um, the, the, the ice sheet models um, 
they don't simulate that, right? They they have at, at the sort of at the ice sheet level, they have lots of sort of non-linearities in the in the ice melting process, but the, the the sea level rise projections are actually continuous and smooth. They're they're, they're steep, <laughs> they're you know they're worrying, um, but they but they're not um, they're they're not th themselves discontinuous. So it, uh, in a way, what I'm saying is there's there's quite an interesting modeling question about when it would actually be appropriate to think of these physical phenomena as, as being subject to discrete tipping events versus tipping points being a more a broader rhetorical framing for a set of phenomena which sometimes are more continuous in nature, at least at the global level. Thanks very much, Simon. Uh, I'll have to leave it there for the moment uh, to uh, now. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Yongyang Kai. Uh, Yongyang is Associate Professor in uh, the Department. Uh, sorry, I just need to uh, in, in, in the Department of Agriculture, Environmental and Development Economics and a core faculty of the Sustainability Institute at Ohio State. Uh, he's also an affiliated researcher in the Center for Robust Decision Making on Climate and Energy at the University of Chicago. Uh, Yong Yang received his PhD from Stanford in computational and mathematical engineering and has previously uh, held research positions at the Becker Friedman Institute at the University of Chicago and as a visiting fellow in the Hoover Institute at Stanford. Uh, Yong Yang, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, thank you for uh, all uh, people attending this presentation. And uh, thanks to OECD for organizing this uh, great uh, workshop. So uh, today I'm going to present uh, economic uh, implications of multiple interacting tipping points. So uh, we would like to address uh, these questions. What can and should be policy response to rising carbon concentration in the face of uncertainty? So our way is to create a framework, dynamic stochastic integration of climate and economy, this size. So this framework in club, uh, incorporates climate risk. And uh, here, climate risk, uh, we assume uh, the tipping time is uncertain and it could have multiple interacting tipping points. And uh, these multiple interacting point, uh, tipping points could have a domino effect. And uh, also, we also uncertain about the damage level. And we also don't know how long it will take for this tipping process. Because once the tipping happens, it doesn't mean that it will immediately in one second, everything will drop, uh, you know, damage will fully unfold. So here we are assuming, uh, so it takes time and uh, but we don't know how long it will take. And uh, in this framework, we also discuss economic risk and the parameter uncertainty, but uh, in this presentation, I don't uh, talk about them, just focus on tipping points. So uh, this presentation is based on the following four papers, uh, collaborated with uh, Thomas Lanchak, uh, Tim Lampton, Ken Jada, and uh, Deju Naluta. So published in Nature Climate Change, PNAS, and uh, Journal of Political Economy. So first, uh, what is uh, our schematic of this size? So this uh, size is a stochastic extension of dice. So dice, not how the dice model. So uh, for this schematic here, so we have economic uh, uh, activity. So it uh, generates uh, emission. So more emission then uh, lead to higher carbon concentration in the atmosphere. And uh, we have three levels of carbon concentration and uh, they interact with each other. And uh, higher carbon concentration in the atmosphere lead to higher temperature in the atmosphere. Uh, they also have two levels, uh, they interact with the ocean. And then uh, higher temperature in the atmosphere lead to higher damage to economy. And uh, then, uh, so this is the Northern House uh, Dyson model, is a deterministic. And uh, then a social plan that maximizes a uh, uh, present value of utility from consumption and uh, uh, by choosing optimal consumption and uh, mitigation. So this is the Dyson model. So we extended it by adding uh, climate risk here and also economic risk. So here we have uh, multiple interacting team elements here. They are stochastic and uh, they uh, create uh, new damages to economy and uh, could have additional release of carbon. 
And uh, so here's uh, then the social plan uh, maximizes the expected uh, social welfare now. Okay. So then uh, the climate tipping module, uh, we model it uh, uh, the process as a Markov chain with uh, the probability transition matrix. So here we see uh, P is a tipping probability. So it's dependent on time uh, temperature T. So, uh, so when uh, temperature is higher, then we see the pro tipping probability will be higher. And uh, here you see even temperature stop increasing, like uh, it's stick at degree two, then we still assume there has a probability of tipping here. And uh, if we can control the temperature below one, then uh, tipping probability is zero. So uh, from this tipping and also from this global warming, they create the damages to output. Uh, we assume uh, follow not house is uh, proportional to output. So this damage factor has two parts. The numerator part here, we change it at the node house function. The denominator part is node house quadratic damage function. So uh, this uh, numerator here, so we see the J is a damage level for long climate tipping process. It's zero before tipping event and uh, will gradually increase to its upper bound in many years. And uh, we will also show that uh, we cannot change this uh, quadratic function to higher exponent like a degree four, degree six polynomial and uh, ignore tipping uh, by using a deterministic uh, damage function. We will show that uh, that uh, cannot capture uh, well. So here's our first paper's uh, results about a uh, carbon tax. So uh, we can see this is from the 10,000 simulation uh, passes. So we assume that tipping duration is 50 years after the tipping happens. And uh, then the final damage level is 10 percentage. So from zero to 10, so gradually increase to 10 percentage after 50 years. And uh, the hazard rate is, is low. So we can see uh, the right panel of this picture. So uh, at the end of next century is the, that cumulative probability of tipping is less than 50 percentage. Then uh, what uh, uh, will it uh, happen to our social cost of carbon or optimal carbon tax? So uh, in the initial year, it uh, has a uh, 50 percentage increase above that deterministic model. So this tells us the threat of tipping points. So uh, creates an incentive to reduce the tipping probability. So uh, you know, if we have a higher carbon tax, then it will have lower emission, then higher, uh, then lower temp, uh, carbon concentration, lower temperature, then lower tipping probability. Because we assume the tipping probability here depends on temperature. The temperature lower than tipping probability is lower. So this incentive uh, is there. So we want to, that's why we want to have a much higher uh, tipping uh, carbon tax. So if we assume this uh, probability is exogenous and uh, independent of temperature, then we'll have some more increase, but not much. And uh, also another thing is, uh, you see, uh, in around 2040, uh, one percentage quantile of uh, things of tipping event happens. So once this tipping event happens at this time, it has immediately significant drop of social cost of carbon. Why? Because uh, we see that as an incentive to delay or cancel tipping uh, risk that the tipping event is gone, is completely gone. Because we assume after the tipping starts, then this is an irreversible process. We cannot change it. So that's why uh, you see at the, here the second uh, drop jumper is a, a 10 percentage quantile. So it uh, is dropped significantly now, then gradually, gradually uh, is after 50 years, because this 50 years is uh, our damage uh, gradually uh, increase uh, damage from the tipping process. So uh, here then uh, we see the second result of the first paper. Uh, we talk about uh, the gross rate of carbon tax. So here are four lines. So this blue line is the bottom one. So this one is a gross rate of the expected additional carbon tax with the tipping point. Then uh, the black line is the ice carbon tax. And the two red lines 
are also dice, but are using higher exponent of damage function, degree four or degree six. So we can clearly see this uh, line here, close rate of additional carbon tax uh, with tipping point is much lower and flat. So why it happens? Because this can be seen as uh, uh, things like, um, you know, lower discount rate. So uh, smaller growth rate is uh, equivalent to saying a lower discount rate. So uh, when we think about investment in capital, we know uh, then as they have some, uh, we invest it, then we have a higher future output. Then this output, uh, you know, this uh, will be discounted by the marginal return, the return of this uh, investment. So this discount rate is the interest rate here. So, but if we investment in mitigation, uh, first it will reduce damage, future damage. So then uh, it means to increase the expected future output. So this part will be discounted by interest rate. But a second effect of this mitigation is to reduce the variance of this future output. So notice that our tipping probability depends on temperature. So if we have this uh, reduced tipping probability, then uh, uh, we reduce the temperature, reduce the tipping probability, then reduce the variance. So these two effects of mitigation tells us that we should use a lower discount rate. So, uh, and also uh, if we just use this deterministic model, but uh, use degree four or degree six uh, uh, damage function, like these two red lines, so you see that there uh, will be have much higher close rates here because they will have much higher discount rates. Okay, so uh, then uh, we uh, see this uh, second paper's uh, uh, carbon tax uh, with environmental tipping points. So uh, here we in, uh, discuss the non-market goods. So uh, we see that substitutability between non-market and market goods is limited. So when we uh, when environmental goods and services become scarcer, their relative price increases. So that's why we should uh, incorporate uh, the non-market goods in our utility directly using a constant uh, electricity of substitution utility function here. So uh, when we see this picture here, this uh, red line, sort of line is a dice uh, carbon tax. And uh, this dashed red line is the uh, a uh, relative price effect. So we incorporated the non-market goods there, but it's still deterministic model. Then the other lines that is our stochastic model with both the market and non-market goods. So we can clearly see it immediately jumps up. So uh, the carbon tax is much higher when we include this non-market goods loss here. Here only five percentage loss and uh, probability is a five percentage when the temperature increase is about four degree higher Celsius, four Celsius degree higher. So it's not a, it's very conservative, conservative uh, assumptions, but uh, the, their uh, carbon tax will jump us up uh, immediately in the initial years. And if we include both uh, non-market and non-market then it will be about a, a triple times, yeah, more than triple. So now the third paper discusses uh, the multiple interacting tipping points. So we have five uh, tipping elements in our model. So these are green and ice sheet, AMOC, Amazon, and uh, El Nino, and the West Antarctic ice sheet. So they are interacting each other as the team just uh, said too. So we see uh, these red arrows means uh, they are increasing tipping probability. So if, for example, here, if the ice, Greenland ice sheet melts first, then it have additional flash water into Atlantic Ocean, then it increases the likelihood of AMOC uh, tipping. So significantly increasing the likelihood. But if this AMOC tipping happens first, then it will have uh, reduced the warming of Greenland. So it means it decreases the uh, probability of uh, melting of Greenland ice sheet. Yang, sorry, you have two minutes. Okay, so then these are our uh, results. So this uh, dashed line means uh, 
we have ignored the tipping point interaction. So uh, no surprise, that, you know, every time if a tipping happens, then it drops down significantly. But the Greenland ice sheet uh, tipping just dropped slightly here. But if we incorporate the tipping points interaction, then here I see Greenland ice sheet, once it happens, it increases significantly, jumps up. So why it happens? Because uh, the tipping probability of AMOC is increased significantly by this uh, Greenland ice sheet uh, uh, tipping. So then we would like to reduce this uh, tipping probability by uh, have higher carbon tax. So similarly for the El Nino. Uh, so this is why you know, uh, we have this uh, kind of uh, issues. Then in our first paper, we discussed this. Uh, then, uh, but we don't know that tipping times so don't. have these uh, two sample passes uh, here. So the left see there here. So this blue line so the cost of carbon pass. So if we see that damage pass the blue line, so at this 2140, 2140, so it has a bigger jump of damage because of the first tipping event happens at this time. Then uh, after several years, uh, then second tipping event, then third, then fourth, then fifth tipping events. But we see that social cost of carbon, it just drops down significantly at the first time of the tipping event. Afterwards, it's just gradually increasing. No bigger jumps here. Because the incentive to cancel or delay the tipping events is gone after the first tipping event happens because this is a domino effect. So once the first event happens, no matter how hard we try, the following four tipping events will happen, just uh, maybe longer, maybe slower, uh, you know, we don't know. So then uh, here's uh, my summary here. So um, we see the discount rate for these potential future damage from tipping events is much lower than market interest rate. And uh, at climate tipping points, uh, significantly increases the social cost of carbon or carbon tax if tipping probability depends on temperature. So here you see uh, we, it must be endogenous tipping. So, and uh, even we use the very conservative assumptions about the tipping damage levels, uh, duration and the hazard rate. And uh, here we don't talk about expected social cost of carbon. We just uh, using this decision in the face of uncertainty. So this, that's why only one unit number of social cost of carbon. And uh, this also, uh, you know, have the risk aversion there. So then uh, also, uh, if we include the environmental tipping risk with non-market goods uh, damage, then it will also increase the social cost of carbon significantly. And uh, if a tipping event occurs and uh, there are no, uh, no more other tipping events, then social cost of carbon drops down immediately. And, uh, but uh, if there are multiple tipping events, and then after one tipping event occurs, if it increases the likelihood of other tipping events significantly, and their tipping probability depend on temperature. So that means we can reduce the tipping probability. Then the social cost of carbon could jump up significantly. Otherwise, it will jump down. And uh, if you, you are interested for some extended discussion about uh, these other uncertainty like uh, climate uncertainty, model uncertainty, policy uncertainty, uh, uh, also uh, here, please see this is uh, my review article here for in controlling climate change. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Yang, mm -hmm. and uh, for presenting uh, fascinating results from four papers in, in such a short time. Uh, I hope we'll be able to pick on some of these findings in the discussion. Uh, let me just pose one quick question, if you have a, a, an easy answer to that. Uh, you have added this tipping module to the DICE function uh, to take care of catastrophic impacts, but the DICE damages already include consideration of catastrophic impacts, uh, you know, through the expert elicitation and so on. Uh, is, is there any double counting uh, there? Oh, yeah. 
So here, not double counting here, because dice, uh, when dice include the catastrophic effect, dice, in fact, changes this quadratic function to a uh, degree six uh, or some uh, exponents. So that's why but the numerator is still one in dice model. So they just change the, uh, this uh, quadratic damage function. As we just showed, uh, you know, if we use degree six, you know, these gross rates are very different. So that's why using this deterministic model is always uh, uh, not safe for, uh, for these stochastic events, particularly if they are endogenous, the events are dependent on temperature, yeah, uh, the property. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll unfortunately have to leave it here for the moment. Uh, let me uh, now invite uh, Professor Christian Traeger, who's Professor of Economics at the University of Oslo and Research Director at the IFO Center for Energy, Climate and Resources uh, in, in Munich. Sorry, I'm just, um, uh, previously he taught environmental economics at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Christian holds an MA and a PhD in economics from the University of Heidelberg and an MA in physics from the State University of New York in Stony Brook. His research includes climate change and environmental economics into temporal welfare analysis and decision theory. Christian, the floor is yours. Sorry for taking it a moment early. Thank you very much for having us out here and putting together this nice workshop. Very interesting. And uh, yeah, I'll continue here. And I'll actually, as you say, we're in reverse chronological order. I will go back a little bit uh, before my time, chronological order. Actually, I just see that uh, Bill Nordhaus popped on. So, uh, that is actually going back to him. And I think there is this misunderstanding that the early models did not think about uh, catastrophic risk. And we've heard that a little bit today actually as well. So I think it's good to start a little bit earlier and point out that uh, back in 1994 already, Bill Nordhaus had this beautiful uh, questionnaire sent out to natural and social scientists asking them about the probability of a 25% a loss in global income indefinitely under three degrees Celsius warming by in 100 years and under six degrees Celsius warming in almost 200 years. And he elicited these probabilities and they actually entered the dice damage function. And then in uh, 2000, when they updated the uh, model, they actually also cited the literature, including the thermohyaline um, concern about the thermohyaline circulation that was discussed a little bit today and others. And they said that they updated these damages. Um, so they actually doubled the damage estimates from the earlier survey, sorry, doubled the probabilities from the earlier surveys. They also increased the impact another 20%. It's like a regional ag aggregate that then gets aggregated into the DICE models damage coefficient. And if you look at these notes, the catastrophic damages actually make up about half to two thirds of the damage coefficient in the DICE model. So whenever people have been using the DICE model at the time, they have actually been including quite a bit of catastrophic damages, the type that you know, we partly were looking at in more detail today. Um, and then I think the first uh, study I realized, but I think that was one earlier, it was not in the DICE apparently, but by uh, Keller and co-authors at Penn State, uh, yeah, Penn State University and GEM, where they actually integrate these damages with discrete risk, a little bit of learning into the DICE model. And there they find like an increase of the abatement rate um, that was a discussion going on earlier between um, Simon and um, Tim. So they found a bit of an increase of the social cost of carbon there and the um, optimal abatement rates. And then I want to go back to, uh, to the next generation of uh, Bill's model, the DICE 2007 model. If you look at the lab notes, still over half of the damage coefficient is actually driven by the estimates of catastrophic risk. So when then um, some of us went ahead and included um, included damages uh, of the tipping point nature explicitly in DICE, I think to some degree it is fair to adjust them. And in our first study that I cite here, we had not done that. We have added them sort of on top. Um, and there we built on uh, path-breaking work by Kelly and Kolstad, who uh, first sort of had pure stochastic research, recursive dynamic, uh, dynamic stochastic <laughs> programming version of the DICE model and put in these climate tipping points. So these are not in the damage function. These are in the climate system. There are feedbacks in the temperature, feedbacks in the carbon sink uptake. So they are not happening abruptly here. They're happening with some delay. 
they therefore also lead to actually a somewhat moderate increase of the social cost of carbon if we put them in there. So we were wondering, well, you know, that uh, might underestimate what's really going on. Let's try to look at the tipping dominoes that were discussed quite a bit at the time. So interaction between different tipping points. And we had an interaction of a decrease in the carbon sink uptake of like a temperature feedback that would increase over time the equilibrium temperature, as well as a direct impact in the damage function. And once we put all of these together, and uh, admittedly, I think we were maybe erring in the side of making it too big, we ended up with approximately doubling the social cost of carbon. And um, that though, you know, once we adjusted the coefficients for taking out some of these catastrophic damages that already led uh, to the original damage coefficients in dice, pretty much left the social cost of carbon exactly where it were in the dice 2007 model, merely because now we explicitly model some of these tipping points but then we felt that it would be fair to take out some of the um, back of the envelope adjustments that uh, Bill had done at the very beginning. And um, one particular issue I think with our study is that we had an immediate, uh, we didn't immediately jump the damages up, but we had an immediate change from uh, quadratic to cubic damages. So that would, if it happens, the damage function itself would happen very immediately. So there's this nice study that, um, Yong Yang just talked about that these should happen more slowly. And so that is one issue why ours is maybe a little bit too large there. Um, then um, Kai and Lonzek actually uh, put that together with a delay into a model where they modeled the damage tipping points exactly. He just talked about the study, just sort of to bring it to the point. Also, they find pretty much a doubling of the social cost of carbon. Um, even though they have the delay in there, there are minor differences in the models that I can discuss if there are questions. Um, but sort of one thing that they put in is these Epstein's in preferences that give you a little bit more of a drive from the risk. Um, and then uh, they actually decided not to reduce the original coefficient of the damages, maybe, you know, because damages might be higher than we, we think currently. But then, of course, you get a serious doubling of the social cost of carbon if you don't adjust the damage coefficients up front. And I think the last one I want to mention, um, and I'm aware that I'm giving a very sketchy review here, but it's a very recent paper by Takone and co-authors um, in Erie that points out that uh, these tipping points in particular, if we model them straight in the damage function, even if we use nice stochastic models, mostly operate through the expected damages, which sort of confirms some experience we have had by putting ambiguity into these models and all this stuff that actually most of it is just an increase in expected damages, which would also get us back to why Bill's back of the envelope uh, calculations might have already done a really good job. And um, maybe one reflection here is um, that to me, possibly one of the big questions uh, we really have to address is just how these um, tipping points, these detailed tipping points that Tim and Simon discussed more uh, from a less abstract level really translate into changes of the expected damage function. Um, or expected damages around the world. Um, and if we want to think about what makes tipping points per se very special as compared to, to smooth damages, it's maybe more, um, you know, the translation, but then there are these irreversibilities. We can't undo them. If we have these irreversibilities, um, they might matter, but currently our models don't really take them very seriously because our models, if we optimize, don't really want to revert um, but that would be an interesting point, I think, for, for later modeling of tipping points. I forgot to start my timer. I'm sorry, Shadow. Can you give me a brief time here? Um, you've got uh, eight or nine minutes. Left. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so then I want to take these to look maybe a little bit of what uh, might be interesting about tipping points and their interaction in particular. That's something we're missing if we're just looking at the expected damages. And for that, I want to go back to this study I mentioned earlier about three different tipping points that we put into a version of the DICE model. And one of them sort of reduced the CO2 uh, uptake capacity of the carbon sinks uh, by 50%, which is pretty drastic, but we will see that it has a somewhat minor impact. So we wanted to err on the side of being too high there. One was a warming feedback that will over time eventually lead to an increase of the equilibrium temperature 
that would go to five degrees instead of three degrees Celsius if it's triggered. And then um, we had one of these economic damage tipping points um, where it wasn't the level, but the quadratic damage function turned into a cubic one. So if it would happen right now, there wouldn't be a jump in the levels, but it's mostly putting more pressure on in the future. But if it does happen in the future, it would actually create a jump, which is not nice. It would be handled better by the methods that Yong Yang had introduced. Um, and what we uh, discussed there is sort of the interaction between these tipping probabilities, uh, climate policy, if it's optimal, and what the cost of a delay of climate policy is. I would like to focus um, more on the interaction between tipping points and what the results there are. So this is just repeating what I already talked about, that we find pretty much a doubling of the social cost of carbon, but if we adjust the original damage coefficients, we very much find no change in the forecast of the DICE 2007 model. Um, but if we look at the interactions between the different tipping points, then, for example, if we combine this feedback in the temperature uh, system, which leads to a higher warming eventually, with this damage tipping point, which you know is basically a shortcut for sea level rise and, and other uh, impacts, then there is an interaction that makes the joint modeling of the two tipping points, um, the social cost of carbon that results 35% higher than if we were to model them individually in two different models. And if you ask the same question for the carbon sinks and the damage interaction, the social cost of carbon would be about 22% higher than if we were to separately model it in one model with a carbon sink decline in one model where the damages are directly affected, e.g. through sea level rise. And uh, finally, the interesting part here is that the lowest interaction is actually between the two that we have in the natural system, the climate feedbacks and the uh, uh, decrease of the carbon sinks, partly because it is a lot of delay that comes in the system there if we have these two. And we're discounting here at the standard rate of the DICE 2007 model. So it doesn't make that big an impact. And that might change if we were to discount less, which might be reasonable. I have argued so in like other papers, but um, here the feedback is not so big. And then if we have the triple interaction, it's a 50% increase as compared to just modeling them in three different models. So that was the one thing about the um, interaction. And this is another slide about the interaction, which looks a bit complicated, but let me sort of try to get the gist of this uh, graph out there. It's in our major climate change paper. What you see on the vertical axis is an illustration of the uh, domino effect that is of the likelihood of eventually triggering a second tipping point as a consequence of triggering a first tipping point. So let's start with that black solid line here. The black solid line would tell us if there is no interaction between the first and the second tipping point, what is the probability that a second point eventually happens if the first tipping point was triggered, say, here in 2080? So in 2080, we have the first tipping point. In our model along the optimal trajectory, the probability of triggering yet a second tipping point with no interactions would be about 30%. Why is this probability declining over time? Because we are stabilizing temperatures towards the mid of the next century, following pretty much the optimal policy in the 2007 model. Now, what happens if there is an interaction? And let's think about the first tipping point being triggered is the one that increases the temperature feedbacks. So the tipping of the next tipping point, or the likelihood of tipping the next tipping point goes up tremendously, right? because now the same CO2 causes a lot more warming. That means it's much more likely that we cross another temperature threshold. So probability almost doubles here in this example. And then that is if we keep policies constant, what happens if we adjust our policy to optimal policy? Yong Yang had some illustrations that we do adjust to tipping point, optimal tipping point policies after it happened. And that goes down then to the blue dotted line. So blue dotted line is still quite an increase of the tipping probability, assuming we do optimal policy in this type of DICE 2007 based model. If in contrast, we had the carbon sink tipping point happen first, so now we have a decrease in the carbon sinks, less CO2 will be taken up by the oceans and the biosphere, then also 
we would jump up first in the uh, probability of triggering the next tipping point eventually. But if we adjust temperature optimally, it comes down to this blue dashed line. So we can counteract, we should counteract these probabilities a bit. And maybe quite interesting is the last one. If we just have a tipping point that only models damages in the economic function here, then keeping policy constant, it doesn't affect the domino effect in the sense of triggering another one because it's nothing really happening to the climate system. But if we then adjust our optimal policy, in our case, we have now um, cubic instead of quadratic damages, it means we will actually increase our social cost of carbon. So actually the policy, the probability of triggering another tipping point goes down. So there is quite a wide range of what can happen if different types of uh, tipping points interact. And it can be quite different uh, whether we model them in the climate system or whether we model them in the damage function. Some of them might reinforce, reinforce the risk, others um, might actually reduce the risk if we have optimal policy, that's the condition there. Um, let me just talk very briefly about thinking about risk aversion a little bit more. This was um, a paper where we looked at ambiguity because there is this, I mean, we saw it in Tim, Lent, <laughs> Tim Stark and part of that is what we use to calibrate our models, these color-coded diagrams of, of riskiness, right? So we don't really know what the probabilities and the threshold probabilities are. And so we introduce, for example, ambiguity and assume that you know, policymakers would be particularly adverse because we don't know the probabilities of these tipping points to happen. And that is a bit like increasing risk aversion. And uh, I think I will just leave it at the main message here. If you look at the numbers, um, where you have just sort of standard uncertainty, where it's ambiguity, where you have strong ambiguity. All of these numbers are under an optimal policy. What is the likelihood of crossing particular thresholds? It hardly makes a difference. And the reason is you could also look at it in the social cost of carbon. Ambiguity of version hardly makes a difference. It comes very much down to the expected damages that are caused by a particular tipping point in these models. And that brings me to my concluding thoughts here that I do think tipping points are very important. Um, I think mostly we do not know where the threshold exactly lies, so we can't just simply avoid it uh, very easily. And then I think it comes back to being very similar to smooth damage functions. And I think Simon raised that question, you know, to what degree is tipping point in the sea level really supposed to be a tipping point or is it more like a smooth damage or, and I think the main, the biggest challenge might really be this translation of these natural phenomena into expected damages, which is even harder than it already is to get our damages right. I think that's something we're all struggling with in the discipline. And if we really want to look at the specifics of why is the tipping nature or the abruptness of a change, which might not be so abrupt after all on the global scale, uh, very important. I think we might want to invest more into looking into irreversibility and hysteresis effects whether they might be relevant, because that would be a difference to smooth damages. Um, we want to look more at the interactions, just as Tim did in his study that he did in the morning between different uh, tipping points. And maybe sort of what we're going to discuss in tomorrow's se session, that is, if there are very abrupt um, impacts, and in particular, is there is not optimally controlled uh, climate systems around, and then we have like behavioral market responses or something that would of course be another interesting phenomena that we have not studied much yet. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Christian, both for presenting your results, but also a very nice synthesis of uh, insights coming from the recent uh, literature. Um, if I take it, one of your main messages is that in the end, in the face of uncertainties about the, 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 the timing and unfolding of these tipping points, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, looking at the expected value of the damages is, is, is perhaps okay. I mean, ultimately, you ended up with similar results as DICE 2007, for example, in this thought experiment. So my question is a blunt one. Uh, is there a need for adding this stochastic module within models like DICE to, to look at the dynamics of tipping points or would the final result in terms of SEC uh, not be sufficiently different? It's a tough question. I, I kind of moved a little bit away from doing it stochastically because of what you're just saying and the summary, because I do think it has 
maybe the really figuring out the damages, the work sort of that, that Tim was doing there, but then translating it all the way through the ecosystems into economic damages might be the biggest challenge out there, uh, the most important challenge. But, you know, we might also develop the other models just to better do it. I mean, the nice thing about, so for example, what Simon did is you can just synthesize a lot more models um, in sort of a, a simulation study as compared to our optimization studies. I mean, Yong Yang has been pushing boundaries on what you can do. I think with new machine learning, you can do a lot more. Um, so I, I wouldn't say we shouldn't do that, but I just want to say that it's extremely valuable maybe also to just have these simulation-based non-optimizing studies, just trying to get us expected damages better. And also if you work together interdisciplinary, trying to couple the ecology with the uh, physical models and economic impacts, it's very hard to do it in these frameworks that Yong Yang and I have been using. And I think we get a lot of very valuable information as we already got sort of from this back of the envelope calculation, but, you know, build it uh, over 20, 25 years ago. So, um, yeah, I, I think there is a lot of other very valuable rules to take. And it doesn't have to be the way that, you know, we have modeled it here. I, I, yeah. Thanks very much, Christian. So. Uh... With that, I, uh, I transition to our last speaker of the day, and, and that's uh, Professor Bill Northhouse. He's Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale. Uh, he did his undergraduate uh, at Yale uh, in the early 60s, got his PhD from MIT, uh, and uh, as all of you know, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2018 for integrating climate change into long run macroeconomic analysis. Um, I'm going to limit his bio because I think all of us are familiar with his distinguished career, but even before the Nobel Prize, I can say that, uh, you know, his, his work on climate economy modeling uh, has, has, has really, uh, you know, being singularly impactful for, for the entire uh, field of researchers. And even during this short afternoon, the number of times you probably heard Nordhaus or Dice uh, is uh, you know is probably once or twice in every every talk. So uh, I'm not going to make a long introduction. It's just a great honor and privilege uh, to, to to welcome Bill Nordhaus. Bill, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me just get my screen up here. All right, so uh, it's, it's wonderful to be at this meeting. It's very exciting. I think one of the things about this particular field is it combines uh, issues which are extremely interesting and extremely important. <laughs> and there are very few things we do that combine those two things. Uh, as I reflected over the last couple of talks back to what has happened since, well, since I first started thinking about this or to take the example of the 1994 survey, um, we, if you think of the 1994 survey, it was actually asking people, put your finger up to the wind, see which way it's blowing. What do you think? What are your hunches? Uh, and now here we are in 2021, we've we found out what are, are those hunches right? Are they wrong? Uh, we've been able to quantify them using empirical modeling uh, to do those. So uh, I think we've come a long way. Uh, we made a lot of progress, but I think there's, there's still Many open issues, as this uh, as this uh, conference has suggested, and I'll, I'm going to talk about two of them. Uh, let me just start out with talking about categories of catastrophes. So I th I want to talk about um, really uh, just this list here. There there are micro catastrophes, uh, low lying islands, extreme storms. Uh, they're not discussed here, but but they're virtu they're virtually certain. We we don't know what the scales are going to be if we think of categories like hurricanes, one, two, three, four, five. Um, there's significant work here. We know this is gonna happen. Um, and um, that's interesting. Uh, then the second set is what I call complex catastrophes. Uh, these are ones that uh, I think have been very much involved today, uncertainty, fat tails, irreversibility, hysteresis. Uh, and those are complex and, and uh, they're hard to get a handle on. Uh, but again, I think we're making some progress there. And then what I'll call just straight old plain vanilla macro, macro catastrophes, uh, geophysical ones of the tipping point that Tim has talked and others have talked about, ecological ones, which I haven't heard much about, and then just the human ones, economic and non-market. Um, 
Now, uh, on the geophysical, I, I want to say, uh, which we've had a lot on in this today, I want to say a little bit about those. Those have been discussed by Lenten et al. and then uh, the recent analysis by Dietz et al. And I'll talk about two things that seem to me to be useful looking forward. One is I think we need improved what I call tipping metrics. Uh, there's a, a kind of thought, if you look at some of the work that uh, the tipping is a, you pass a given T temperature, T threshold, um, and then you've tipped, but, but we know that's not the case. We know that uh, it's much more complex than that. Um, and sometimes these T thresholds and the tipping points are thought to be a good rationale for uh, degree X degree target in our climate policy, but, but that's, that's, that's actually not generally accurate. Um, and we, I think if we are gonna use metrics, we need uh, better metrics. Now, when I looked at the Greenland ice sheet, and this was uh, Richard Alley and Klaus Keller actually were the ones who, who showed this, although I think it was, it's kind of obvious that um, a better metric is something like uh, temperature years or some integral of temperature rather than some max temperature. And so I think one of the, one of the things we need to do is get better metrics. Uh, more important than that though, I think is the need to improve coupling of economic and geophysical models. And again, I'll take the, the example of the Greenland ice sheet, which uh, I, I, I spent many, many years trying to figure out how to do that. And uh, really what I did in the end was take a, the uh, runs of, mo of different models, try to summarize them in a simple um, model that you could integrate in a, in a dice type model, a small model. So not a supercomputer model, but a PC type model. And one that you could optimize, which has even greater, constraints because of the optimization is a kind of uh, matrix inversion, not just as a recursive program. And it's, it's okay, it worked. I mean, I think it, in a sense, it's the spirit of integrated assessment models. But what we really need is a completely different thing. We need to integrate some of our large geophysical models with our economic models. Um, and that's a very complex process. And we have not, I think we haven't mastered that. And I think that's on our agenda. I remember many years ago, I won't mention who it was, but I said, some of you had a, a model of uh, intermediate um, complexity. And I said, would you like to integrate this and do some runs? And it's a really interesting methodological issue. And the person said, no, not really. We're too busy doing other things. But I think there are some people who are not too busy. And I think this is a really interesting frontier issue of, um, of, of computational science to integrate large models and some of our optimization models. Now on uh, ecology, I don't have anything to say. On uncertainty, uh, that's an important issue, but I'm gonna postpone that uh, for another day. Uh, but what I wanna talk about, I'm sorry. What I wanna talk about today is, trying to have, I wanna talk about the, I want to go to straight economics. Uh, we don't. We usually usually we do integrated assessment, but I think at, I'll talk about one area where I think we've really overlooked um, a critical issue, a very live critical issue, and I, I think we need to get this get this straightened out. Okay. First, uh, let me say something about um, let me say something about um, economic impacts or economic catastrophes in general. Uh, one thing we know is we know that there are economic catastrophes. Um, I'll just show you some, I'll show you some examples in a minute, but uh, we don't have to go up to, um, we don't have to go up to ice sheets and uh, uh, meridian overturning circulation to find catastrophes because we have lots of them in human history. And I'll just show you some examples. I took the, um, the Penn World Table, which many of you may know about who are economists, um, which is a comprehensive uh, set of economic accounts going back to 1950, it goes up to 2019 now. It, it's, a, it's a really wonderful set of accounts. And so what I did is I just did a simple thing. I just asked where are the, what have been the major 10 year disasters since 1950 that sort of say, what are the countries which have had the greatest 10 year declines in per capita GDP since 1950, or actually per capita, it should be per capita real income, uh, which it corrects for terms of trade effects and uh, which would be important for oil companies. 
And uh, I'll just show you those. So these are the worst economic declines. And these are for 10, over 10 year period. You could do different periods, but these are substantial periods. And the, uh, those are the countries, those are the 10 year declines. And so the top, uh, I don't know why, these are the top nine countries, but they range from the worst being Nigeria, Venezuela, Liberia, which were in the mid eighties. So 80% 80 decline in real income over a 10 year period and then uh, go down to the uh, Tajikistan, Zimbabwe, Kuwait, Qatar, so on and so forth, down to DRC, um, also the end year. And then it's interesting to see what the cause was. I think those who studied the, the decline of nations won't be terribly surprised, but uh, civil strife, war, war, empire collapse, I'm not quite sure what category that comes into, uh, civil strife, uh, Oil, oil, empire collapse, World War War. Uh, so, so mainly, most of these have been basically uh, institutional in the sense of the collapse of the state or wars or other. And then the only the only exceptions which are kind of interesting are oil. And these are basically monocultural economies. They depend on oil. Oil prices are very volatile. You get a bad you get a bad patch, and you can really have an economic disaster. It comes back. So these are. Unlike some, these are these tend to be temporary, but uh, but that's it. That that's where it is. Uh, I, I was curious about whether any of these would be considered environmental. Um, I, I don't think so. I don't think they're climate related. Um, uh, they they may have everything's complex, so they may have a strand of that. But for the most part, they're they're either some kind of political strife or commodity problems. Uh, Okay, but I wanna move on from there. So in the uh, studies of the economic impacts of climate change more recently, there's a lot of work. And just, I'm not, I'm just focused on the, really the pure economics. So this is for basically for macroeconomists uh, and less than one example, this is not really integrated assessment in any real sense. Uh, well, it is a little bit, but not much. And some of the studies suggest uh, human economic catastrophes in our future due to major climate changes. And here, the key issue is going to be what the link is from temperature, whether it's weather or climate and output. And the studies now, uh, go, I'll, I'll give you the first key reference in a, in a minute, but the key issue here is whether an increase in say a climate change, say an increase in um, global mean temperature by one degree C leads to a one-time decrease in output of X percent. And it may be smoothed over time, but it's, it's what I call a level level shift or whether the relationship is uh, that an increase in temperature leads to a decline in the growth rate. So it might be that uh, temperature goes up two degrees C and growth rate might go down, not just a one-time growth rate, but a ongoing growth rate would go down by one, two, three, four percent per year. So it's, it's, it's uh, the, the, and those are the key, that's the key distinction that I wanna talk about now. Now, um, I would say until uh, the early 2000s, I don't know anyone who would have thought of the second specification. Well, I don't, I mean, there may be somebody out there, but I, I didn't know them. And the, the, um, the work that had been influential was the level level uh, analysis. And I can talk a little bit about what its roots were, but I think that's, that's a fact. But much current work now, there was because of the very important work of, uh, uh, Dell, Jones, and Oaken, and then followed up. Much current work now uses a level growth specification. And for example, if you look at the 1.5 degree report of the IPCC, uh, you can look and see where the, what, what the economics was that that relied on. Uh, it was basically a level analysis that used the level growth specification, the second one. Now, what I, if you, what I want to show, some of you may know this, but maybe not, is that if you want to take the level growth specification, then 
you're really uh, assuming an economic that's that that implies a human economic catastrophe just from the economy. You don't need any tipping points. You don't need any um, fancy cubic or quad cortic specifications. You don't need jumps. It's just just simple, uh, simple a simple model. So let me. Let, well, that's what I want to talk about. Uh, and the reason I'm talking about it is because I think it's wrong. Uh, in any case, unproven. Okay. So here's the key. Um, here's the key study that set this all off. It was by Dell Jones and Oka. Now, now those are three of the most distinguished economists uh, in America today. I mean, they're, they're they're just. I know them all. They're just absolutely great economists. Uh, and uh, uh, what else can I say? Uh, and they they wrote this paper in a, a very very good journal. American Economic, American Economic Journal Macro. It's one of the flagship journals of the American Economic Association. And so this, and they, they were interested in what, as macroeconomists, they were interested in what the impact was. They didn't want, they didn't want uh, to do the sort of bottom, the bottom up approach. They wanted to do the top down approach. They, they gathered good data, they had national economic data for going back many, many years uh, of the kind I, I mentioned earlier with the Penn World Table model, but, but even more in some cases. They, they, gathered, they pretty carefully gathered the temperature for the different countries, and then they did some estimates. So here, here is their first and main result um, and the, and, uh, in their paper. So what they did is the dependent variable is the growth rate. Notice this is a growth level specification, or they could do, um, and what they found is that the growth rate, if you count all countries, it's just a simple one. They did a bunch more, but I'm not. I'm just focused on this because not, nothing really changes when you add other things. Uh, was it was a minus 0.32 percentage point decline in growth for each degree in C increase in temperature? So that's decline of that. Now, if they broke it down. This was actually not very successful, I think, the way they did this, but it doesn't matter. Um, they broke it down into rich countries and poor rich countries and poor countries. And then what they found was actually that the poor countries, all of the result was in the poor countries. And, and this is a this is a um, standard error estimate, so it's quite significant. It's a t-statistic of three plus, so pretty significant. Uh, they correct for autocorrelation residuals, so they took out the 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 um, the autocorrelation issues, although there are not going to be many problems, to, sort of AR problems in the growth rate series anyway. And, and that's pretty big. So that's basically 1.6% per year in the growth rate per degree C. So um, I don't know if you think that's small or big, but uh, that's what they got. And this has been, um, this has been tested. And um, I would say it's, this particular result has not been um, overturned, the, the actual econometrics here, but uh, there have been some questions about it. Okay. So uh, what I want to do is show you the implications. So I took their coefficients. And I assume, uh, let's assume temperature rising four degrees C per century, which is pretty much at least 2100 with the model show. And then I do two different um, calculations. One is the level effect, and that's going to be a standard uh, quadratic uh, temperature where the quadratic term is 4% decrease at three degrees C. That, that's pretty standard, maybe small, maybe high, but pretty standard. And then the growth effect is just what they have, um, which is the growth, base growth minus some coefficient time temperature uh, and either the minus 3.2 for all countries or the minus 1.6 for poor countries. All right. So let me show you the results over time. Um, and uh, I don't know if this is, I, I don't know if this is well known, but um, it, it, it should be because it's right in their, right in their equations. Uh, so this is the income loss percent global uh, over the 21st century using those simulate, using that assumption about temperature. So, so it's four degree, four degree over, um, over the century. And uh, the level effect is, you know, it's not trivial, it's uh, maybe 5%. Um, and then the growth effect for, if you just use the all country, you get down about a 50%. 
But if you're looking at poor countries over this period, you're going to have a 97% decline in income. So that's that's it's not a catastrophe in the sense of an overnight catastrophe or tipping. It's just a catastrophe, just a plain catastrophe that you're having this huge decline in the real per capita income of developing countries, of poor countries. Uh, and then if you want to look at the damage function, this is another way to do it. This isn't quite right because it's uh, it, it's a it's a it's a series of snapshots rather than the actual damage function because the damage function is is correct it's drawn correctly for the level but not for the growth so but let's just ignore that but it does show the basic point which is that for uh, either of the two growth effects you're going to have substantial decreases by the time you get to three degree. Uh, pretty catastrophic for poor countries. Well, even pretty bad by the time you get to one degree and really horrible by the time you get to two degrees um, in that implicit damage function. Okay. Um, so then just, uh, here's something you might think of. Um, if you look at the bottom, so this says the difference in impact for poor countries by 2100 is an 8% loss for the level and a 90% income loss for the growth. Now, the, the, here's one, one thing you might ask, what about what would have happened so far? Uh, so this is one test you can do. You don't have to use projections, you can use history. So according to the level growth model, the growth in poor countries should have declined about one percentage point relative to rich countries over the, in the 2010s. Just if you look back at uh, this, you, you already should have had a substantial difference in the growth rates. And if you actually look at the data uh, uh, from the Penrose table, the, the, bottom, the bottom countries grew about 2% faster in 2010 relative to the poor, rich countries than, the, than they had earlier. So there was actually over this period an acceleration of growth of the, of the bottom countries. So that's one, one test we can use for history. Uh, I'd say this just reminds me of uh, so this so this as I say has been adapted more widely than you, than you think, and it just reminds me of something Paul Samuelson I, I once heard him say the problem is not what we don't know, the problem is that so much of what we know is wrong, and I think this is an example of something that has crept into the damage literature that I I think is wrong I I can't prove it's wrong but I think it's wrong. Now. Um, there are, many, there are many issues with the temperature growth. Um, and one of them is that the channels we know the way temperature affect output, some of them we actually, we know from experiments, for example, agricultural experiments and production functions, we know that's a level level. Um, there are all kinds of deep issues, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but I think the main thing I would say about it is there's no plausible an empirically validated mechanism for temperature to affect total factor productivity. And we have two main models of this in the economic literature. We have the Romer model, Paul after Paul Romer, and the learning model. And what I want to do is just show you what those suggest. So the Romer model of technological change is, is this. The first, the first equation is in all the integrated assessment models. So Cobb Douglas production function and output technology, capital, labor, and then some damage function, something like that. But if you go to the Roma model or similar models of endogenous technological change, the rate of growth of technology is a function of, first it's a function of inventive inputs, and then it's a function of basic advances in science. Uh, and it's, there's no obvious mechanism by which temperature would get into that. It could get in through output prices or input prices or, or scarcities, but it's not obvious what is the mechanism by which a change in temperature would get into total factor productivity. And that, that seems to me the weakness and the underlying weakness in the, the level growth me mechanism, which is there's no plausible mechanism. And it's interesting, you can go back and read the papers. They really don't discuss this, starting even with uh, Dell Jones and Olkin. They just assume, uh, they just assume this equation and, and and don't really discuss it in any detail. All right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, so I think the 
the problem, I see the problem with this is, and there've been some studies of this, it was a really nice one by Newell et al, which, I'd, which I say wouldn't, didn't really, it didn't cast the results in doubt, but it showed that the level growth mechanism was, uh, had a, a, a much larger um, sort of uh, posterior than, than you would have thought relative to the level level. Uh, but the, I think the main problem here is that we're using countries as data. So we're using individual countries and the weather in individual countries as data. And just, just to um, clarify this, uh, what, what I've done here is taken sort of how many grid cells, these are latitude, longitude grid cells. This is the basis on which these are constructed. The temperature data are constructed on one degree, one degree uh, latitude, longitude. And, and let's just look at these are, these are uh, 15 countries that are in the study. And you have Russia, Canada, the US, China, Australia, basically a thousand plus, as many in some cases as two or 3000. Then you have other countries that are like 40s. And then you have a few countries that are one or two or four grid cells. So you've got countries in enormously different scale in terms of area, that means climate, and also in terms of economy. And you're all, it's, you're all the same. It's like you take all the animals in the zoo and you do a regression or something of all the animals. Uh, and so I think that's a really problem there. Uh, I, I, think, I think we need to settle this. And I, I would say a key, a key way to do this is to get high resolution economic data. We cannot continue to use the country data to analyze the effect of climate or temperature on output. It's just, you can't use Russia, United States, Panama, Bolivia, Chile, you just, it just won't work. They're just too heterogeneous. And the climate of the United States is an absurd notion, all right? If you think anywhere from Hawaii to Alaska, it's an absurd notion. Um, so what we need is higher resolution economic data, which has better resolution and economic and, and much more homogeneity on uh, geophysical data. I'd say we at Yale are trying to do this. We, we're in the middle of this. But what we're trying to do is compile some subnational data on output and integrate it with the geophysical data. And so stay tuned, but, but we're not there yet. Uh, so I, I just, just say final point. I, I think this settling this is a, is a first order issue in understanding impacts because we're having a lot of studies where, and I mentioned the IPCC 1.5 study, which are using the level growth specification to estimate damages and to estimate the social cost of carbon. And I, I just think that's, that's just, it's at best unproven and you shouldn't do it by itself. But I think it, it isn't very faring very well in the second generation of studies. So I think that's, I will, I will end there as, uh, so the two things that I want to mention, one is this pure economics, I think we have to get this straight. But then in terms of the discussion that we've been having earlier today, I do, I really do uh, urge that we continue to push forward on these structural analysis, moving from the sort of the guesses to the structural analysis of the kind Simon presented earlier. Uh, but I think we need to move a little beyond those in doing some integration of the um, more complex geophysical model, larger models uh, with the uh, smaller economic uh, optimization models. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's it. Thanks very much, Bill, for, uh, for, for your thoughts. Um, before I come to the level versus growth issue, I, I did want to ask you a question about uh, linking economic models with uh, biophysical models for uh, potential tipping points in the climate system. Uh, where, I mean, you did that for the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, where do you see the potential for similar approaches with regard to other tipping points? And if you use large scale biophysical models, is there a risk of losing traceability? I mean, or would you be advocating for using reduced form functions of, of those biophysical models? Yeah, I think just to be clear, the modeling I did of the Greenland ice sheet, and I think also Simon, you're there, I see you. And that Simon did was what what I would call the reduced form. It's not it's not quite the right term, but it captures it. In other words, you you take a, a complex system, you narrow it down to its sort of do a statistical analysis of it to to get its basic equations. Uh, and and we've done though, and 
well, this is not invented in economics, but uh, it's been used widely in other areas as well. Uh, and I think that's a good approach. It's much better than the finger in the air guess approach. But I think it does, it does rely on, it does assume that you can accurately capture these larger models in these, redu in these reduced form models. So what I was at, and I think that that's a big step forward, but I think there's another step which I would advocate, which is to take the large models and so take the ice sheet models, for example. Greenland is a very complex process. One of the things I learned was if you want to take one physical process that, uh, that, that you're never going to be able to understand, take Greenland. And they, they, these ice sheet models are really, really complex. And um, uh, some of the other ones are much simpler, but it's really complex. So you have this very complex model. And you can't really capture it. In that particular case, you really can't capture it with the simple models, you have hysteresis, you have multiple e equilibria, you have stable equilibria and unstable equilibria uh, at, at given temperatures. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting is you take one of these large models, and they're, they're as in many years, a dozen or so large, well-documented, well-tested models of, say, the Greenland ice sheet, and you couple that with an economic model. Now, the, the coupling, the, the trick here is the coupling, how are you going to do the coupling? And I'm, I'm not able to describe that today, but one way to think of it is, I mean, there are a couple of models, is you, 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 can, sh you, can, shoot, um, you can shoot results from one, for example, one from, um, from one model to the other, and then shoot them back. So you basically run them in parallel, but with coupling the variables so the ice sheet model will produce one set of things and the economic model will produce other things like um, emissions and, and global temperature. You might need a regional temperature, but the, the trick is coupling. And it's not difficult in a simulation model because it's a recursive, but it is difficult in an optimization model. And so I, I, I think the first thing to do would be a simulation recursive model, but I think the real trick would be to do it in an optimization model. I've not done it, I have to say. There are some, there are some decomposition procedures around, but I haven't been able to implement them. But I think that's a really interesting uh, thing to, to do methodologically, and I think it's really important for taking these kinds of tipping points of the ones that I did and Simon discussed in his paper, from a computational point of view and others discussed from a theoretical and geophysical point of view, I think this is really an important step forward. Thanks very much, Bill. I, I noticed that we are three, three minutes away from the scheduled close of the, uh, of the workshop today, but uh, we're just beginning to have a very interesting discussion. So for those speakers who can stay and those in the audience who can stay, uh, we'll, uh, I, I suggest we go another 10 or 15 minutes maximum. And uh, you know, the panelists can let me know in case they have a binding obligation and uh, need need to leave. Um, if if I can just ask one more question, but then I'd like to invite the panelists to perhaps ask questions of each other. Uh, the level versus growth issue, and 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 we we discussed this offline. Build this this new paper, uh, uh, um, which also does an empirical analysis on the GDP temperature relationship by. Richard Newell et al., uh, which came out in GEME. And that tested different empirical specifications of the underlying model and, and came to very different conclusions uh, in terms of how significant uh, the, uh, I think, with, especially with regard to using uh, the temperature to growth uh, framing. And, and, and they found that, uh, you know, the uncertainties were uh, very massive across the different specifications. And, and, and for the temperature to level issue, they concluded that the damages were more or less along the lines of the damages that some of the IMs were using. I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on that literature. Well, I, I read that paper and I think it's a fine and useful paper, but I, I, what I would like to characterize it as saying that you have two hypotheses. One, the level level in which if you think of the posterior distribution of the damage coefficients, is pretty is pretty um, peaked. It's it's pretty well determined coefficients in the level level. Uh, for the level growth, it's not that their it's not that their uh, findings are rejected. It's it's that they're not rejected actually, but the priors are so diffuse. The posteriors are so diffuse. So 
I think if you, in a way, if you look back at, give the link. if you look back at the, um, that one slide I had that showed all countries, it had all countries with a small negative coefficient, but a very large standard error. And I think that's a sort of accurate way of, of characterizing the results. What Dell et al. did was find this, they were looking for this result. They didn't really test that result versus the level level, but they found that that result held. Uh, and it held a little more if you did some fine uh, further, further separations of countries and so on and so forth. But in any case, it was not very well determined. So I think what my characterization is that the, um, the estimates on the level level are more precise but you can't reject the level growth model. That was my reading of the new et al. model. So I th that's why I said we need we need a better we need more result higher resolution economic data so you can actually separate out these different these different regions and different countries. We need more observations, not more observations over time, which we're never going to get, but more observations over space. Well, thanks very much. I'd like to invite the panelists in case they have questions or comments following the, uh, the, the presentations that we've had. Uh, Simon, please go ahead. Yeah, just briefly for want of anyone else jumping in quickly, but uh, just to, to endorse the importance of this issue. I mean, uh, models like ours, which, which you know, estimate the social cost of carbon using either a level level or a level growth specification or some mix of the two, you know, the, the, the results depend incredibly sensitively on this. So there, there was a paper published in 2018 in Nature Climate Change using essentially the level growth specification, the social cost of carbon that they estimated ran into thousands of dollars. Um, if you uh, in our model, we have the facility to essentially turn that off and, and treat the, the Burke, est Burke et al. estimates, the empirical estimates as level, level, the, the, you know, the number is back in the Wait 10. Questions. So it's, it's, it's it, it, just to endorse how important this issue is, it was the number one sensitivity in our study, uh, more important actually than the discount rate. Thanks very much, Sam. Uh, any other panelists have any thoughts or reactions if, if we're at that topic i think i mean what some of us discussed i think years back already when we first had the dell Oaken jones coming out is also re-emphasizing what, what bill said is that really it comes down to finding the exact channels like how does it happen i mean you wrote down the endogenous growth model or actually empirically i think one of the concerns might be social instability and you know when you showed the graph of the biggest decline, some of them were triggered by war. So we would probably be talking about individual countries. Other thought maybe, you know, water scarcity triggering some social conflicts, that these might be the only ways that we would affect sort of the growth rate directly. But of course there could be other ways. It's just that there should probably be not also just the endogenous growth paper out there that can show it somehow, which would be nice, but also sort of some empirical evidence, not just at the macro level, but really showing what channel is actually triggering it. I mean, to some degree, the Dell Oaken Jones, I guess, did, did look at, you know, patterns and things, so it might be innovation, but I, I think most of us don't find that too credible, given, you know, most countries have air conditioning, and we could probably still continue uh, our innovation. But finding these channels would be really important um, if we want to back up, because then, you know, differences are usually a huge, um, if, if it really turns out to be growth. Thanks very much, Christian. Um, Yongyang, do you have any comments? Or? Okay, so uh, a little, I'm working on a paper about uh, this uh, closely effect uh, on social cost of carbon and uh, with a special resolution here. And uh, so one thing is, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, these uh, different uh, regions, uh, with different countries or maybe even finer resolution, then economically sometimes it makes less, you know, meaningful. You know, we know climate side is meaningful because uh, from the energy balance model, so this temperature, different region, different temperature, it close. But economically, you know, I feel it's harder to explain these things. So I would like to ask this question too. Thanks 
very much, Young Yang. Um, I'm also looking at some of the questions that came through earlier, uh, which are not about uh, this issue, but but about uh, you know modeling the economic consequences of the biophysical climate tipping points. One question was with regard to adaptation. Uh, how do the kinds of models that uh, all of you discussed, how do they account for adaptation, uh, including different degrees of autonomous uh, adaptation as well as reactive adaptation, role of innovation in those kinds of things? Uh, we, we didn't have much explicit treatment of adaptation in the, uh, you know, in the session so far. So uh, any of the panelists, if they, want, if they would like to comment. Could comment, even though this is uh, not really my research, right? But I mean, there are currently some attempts also around the, uh, the climate impact lab. Um, we're doing a lot of the damage estimates around the world right now to get adaptation in uh, to these estimates. I guess if we take some of the work that actually built it early, that would have you know adaptation included. I think the way that many of them were estimated, but adaptation um, you know at current technology levels, and I don't think what you know. Uh, any of the empirical estimates have or can do is looking at adaptation given technological progress. I thought there was like a very interesting study um, looking at health effects um, and trying to extrapolate the health impacts because that is sort of the first thing coming out of Michael Greenstone's and Sauce Young's and like many others uh, project out of the um, climate impact lab uh, that the health impact from just value of a statistical life loss it is huge. It's you know almost as big as the standard social cost of carbon in the DICE model. Um, but then they also predicted that there is uh, a lot of technological progress in health services, in longevity, and like uh, you know medical adaptation, and that might substantially reduce those costs over time. Actually, so uh, I think that is actually a very good question, a very important question. And I think we're lacking the research. So given you said there are a lot of people watching right now. I think that would be, you know, would be valuable to talk to your brains about how could we possibly get at it a little better than we're currently doing. Yeah. Could I say something? Could I make a point here that I think in the earlier models, the way I thought about it uh, was uh, adaptation is not a global public good. Adaptation is basically a, a private activity. So if, if it gets hot, I put in air conditioning. Um, there are some spillover effects of that, but but that's something I pay for and I get the benefit from. So I, the way I thought about this in the early period was most of the adaptation would take place on a decentralized basis, uh, sort of naturally using um, both adaptation, doing personal adaptation and using market processes. And there was a uh, Gary O did his important work here, which showed. You know, if you were doing, if you had rational expectations, it would look different from if you're backward looking or if you're kind of not really paying attention, waking up 10 years too late. And, and obviously those things make a difference. But I think what, what this misses, and I think is becoming increasingly clear, is the part of adaptation that, in, that either is network-based or involves political processes or involves conflict. And I think a really good example of that is what I, what I call the coming battle of the coastline. Uh, at least in the United States or probably other well, places as well, where you have people who have their coastal properties, extremely valuable properties, they're very attached to them, you know, it's almost as bad as a family farm, it's the family beach property. And as the waters rise, they're going to they're gonna fight to uh, maintain them. Uh, and, um, and so there's a struggle between who's going to control the post coastline, are we going to protect or, or retreat, and, and that's going to be a huge battle. And so that isn't that kind of adaptation, which requires public decisions and very, very painful redistributed public decisions, I think is, is where we're gonna look for adapt, adaptive problems. So the health example, I would say that's one that seems to me that that's one where adaptation does take place. You, you don't have these kind of same kind of network effects there. You have a very uh, innovative healthcare research sector. It's well-funded because members of the legislature don't want to live long, so it's not a problem of funding there. So that one, I think if the adaptation is going to take place through public and private process, process but these other ones that are more network like I, I really, really worry about. Um, Thanks, Bill. Uh, there's a question in the 
in the chat on the point you were making, Bill, about linking biophysical models with economic models. And, and the question is, can you discuss the, and this is for all the panelists, can you discuss the coupling issues a bit more, uh, the spatial and temporal differences between the models, as well as the possibility of using uh, other optimization frameworks? Simon, can you do that? Because you, I know you've thought about this. <laughs> I've already said something. Um, well, uh, I think that a lot of the uh, physical models that we're trying to emulate uh, have very high uh, spatial and temporal resolution. So one of the challenges that we immediately face as economists is, is um, you know, in the absence of similarly high resolution economic data is aggregation so that that's very difficult um and i think that you know one of the big tasks that the climate econometrics folk had to undertake was working out how to uh, aggregate temperature spatially i think for the sort of work we're doing we have other challenges um i think as far as optimization is concerned and this is I, i'm going to pass the baton on to Yong Yang and Christian here, but basically the, the, there is the problem of, 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 of the curse of dimensionality uh, and uh, the ability of sort of standard approaches of solving recursive optimization problems to deal with lots of state variables. Whereas in fact, if you want something that's geophysically realistic, you wind up having a lot of state variables. I've never bothered to count them in our model, but I think it runs into the tens, if not the hundreds. So I think then we're looking at, you know, a bit more into the world of machine learning and sort of solving these things with brute force, but this is not my uh, a skill. This is much more Yong Yang's and Christian's skill. So I'll pass to them to talk about that. Okay. So I could uh, think, uh, you know, uh, we could use uh, some advanced algorithm I recently I developed uh, in this year, so together with Ken Jada, so it's simulated based method, so it can deal with uh, uh, these kind of very high dimensional problems. And uh, another thing, uh, when we deal with this uh, model difference, uh, so we could uh, think about a uh, robust decision making, like uh, so to deal with this model uncertainty. So uh, in that case, uh, computationally maybe also very challenging. So this, that may take time to run it, yeah. But uh, it's, I think it's possible to uh, deal with these things, uh, yeah, with higher, uh, you know, more advanced uh, computational methods and uh, much better computer, <laughs> maybe supercomputer or quantum computer in future. <laughs> I I would add to that maybe sort of I think what what you know you and and I we've been doing is probably more on the order of tenth, you know, of uh, state variables. Um, but there are sort of these machine learning algorithms, Simon Scheidegger is big on them, and he's actually going with it into climate change right now, where it actually can go into the 100 of state variables, um, which, you know, would work pretty well, I think, for some of these models, if they're on a separate regional scale or if they're on a global scale. But if it is also the spatial resolution, of course, that we, we're looking at in some of these scientific models, I think then, then we're kind of screwed even there, sorry. My language. Uh, uh, yeah. Also, in my new algorithm, we also develop uh, the algorithm can work for more than 100 state variables too. So I would like to, yeah, advertise this too. <laughs> I'll, I'll let that be the final word from the panel. We are approaching 5 p.m. in Paris, so we are 15 minutes over. But thank you very much to all the panelists, uh, Simon Dietz, Yong Yang Kai, Christian Traeger, and Bill Nordhaus for a fascinating discussion. Uh, I'm sure we'll be picking up on a lot of points uh, you made in tomorrow's session, where we'll be having another class of modelers, uh, agent-based modelers and central bankers. And, and so for those of you who can, I invite you to join us uh, tomorrow. But uh, from Paris, have a good evening and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Bye.